I have no idea where this will lead us, but I have a definite feeling it will be a place both wonderful and strange. Hello, and welcome to the wonderful and strange Twin Peaks Logcast. I'm Khalil, and with me today is the season two disaster to my season one success. It's been so long since I've ever heard Bert's voice. Ernie's voice is the one that everyone pretends, but I don't recall Bert. Like, Bert has disappeared from my mind completely. The mind of the unplugged professor, because I know you're going to get on my butt after that. But still, what? Is he like this? Is he like this? With me today is the Bert to my Ernie. <laughs> I, th- I was going for Kermit. Kermit, Kermit the Frog. I was no, that was go, worse. Oh, gods. Uh, Miss Piggy, Miss Piggy, Miss Piggy, just higher note Kermit, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> it, that's the disguise all along. Kermit dated himself. The ultimate, the ultimate lie exposed. <laughs> uh, hi. Speaking of hi, lies exposed, I huh? guess. David Lynch. David exposed. Lynch. David Lynch is exposed as well as ourselves. How are you doing, Khalil? I am tired. <laughs> How are you doing, Professor of I'm, the Unplugged? I'm doing fantastic. In fact, I feel filled with all sorts of insights, all sorts of just... Filled with secrets, like Laura Palmer? All sorts of secrets, including mm. Laura Palmer. And uh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to unpack that. <laughs> uh. Let's not worry about it. Let's just like focus away from where it's and just focus on the mood that's invoked mm. by exploring all these personalities together. Today, we are covering all of what I've referred to as documentaries. Arguably, most of them included are a documentary. Ar- arguably, because we'd argue it because I'm correct. So this is our <laughs> third special features podcast. And like the previous, we're going to be going through things from the Z to A collection. Now, with the exception of one special feature, this will be... All of the Z to A collection special features yes. now for the season one and season two of Twin Peaks and Firewalk. All the ones that don't spoil the return. Which is one. So there are no spoilers <laughs> for the return in this venture. However, we'll be doing spoilers for anything related to the OG season one, season two, Firewalk Me Twin Peaks. As well as we might mention things with David Lynch's films up to and through Wild at Heart, nothing after. And we personally have seen like splashes of images from the international pilot in which we found in one of these special features Mm -hmm. but if we bring up we bring up if we don't if we don't but it's just a few images if anything it's going to be okay folks this one's going to be a little different in the sense that if you're a longtime listener this episode i think is going to turn out like a look back episode yes uh i feel that we're gonna we're gonna talk about the documentary stuff there's a lot of interesting cast and crew interviews but there's a lot of jumping off points for tangents so if that's your sort of deal, sit back, relax, unless you are, like, not sitting. If you're, like, at a gym right now or walking in a public area Still sit where back sitting and is relax. not an option at Do the moment. Do it anyway. Ah. Break the rules. Who cares? You're currently parachuting in the sky right now. Don't sit back and relax. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. In case you are someone who would like to follow along with us, because we do highly recommend checking this content out for yourself, this is what we're going to talk about today. From Disc 5, an introduction to David Lynch and Return to Twin Peaks. From Disc 6, postcards from the cast. From Disc 8, secrets from another place, creating Twin Peaks. From Disc 10, moving through time, fire walk with me memories, and reflections on the phenomenon of Twin Peaks. The last feature we're going to talk about from Disc 10. Yep, all of these equally important and good I feel not negative toward any of them more than the other. Nothing in particular? No? No, they're all equally good. uh, Equally good. I'm glad to hear that. And you know what? Just the same way that everyone had equally good things to say about David Lynch, there are all these special features. Hmm. David Lynch was not actually interviewed in any of these things. No. We didn't we didn't see the man except for like some still photos. I believe he was holding the gun behind the camera. If I'm not mistaken, I only recall him in the special features being present in like a slice of Lynch and the, uh, the, the one, other and the yeah. other one that we're not allowed to talk about or look at right yes, now. Yes, because it's in the future. In the future. The distant future of 2017. But for the sheer amount of David Lynch we're listening to, like in, in the life of David Lynch, it's it's mm-hmm. kind of surprising. But then again, as I mentioned to you off pod, uh, Uh, We're ordering this in an insane way and organizing it. By all means, if I were watching this as a usual person, I'd be going through disc by disc and have actually pacing Mm -hmm. throughout this. But no pacing for us. Marathon. Marathon time we go. So, the most David Lynch content we get, arguably, out of nowhere, you wouldn't expect it, is from a feature called An Introduction to David Lynch, Mm -hmm. which 
incredibly introduces you to David Lynch. Oh. My question for you is, how good do you think of an introduction this was to David Lynch? It's very... So... When I'm in thinking about introduction, I suppose that the first thought inside my head is like an e-entertainment, like fun little thing, which is like, oh, we're going into the deep lives of the person, like the David Lynch. But no, it's just more anecdotes and going through the lenses mm -hmm. of people who have worked with them. These are just individual snippets of just people in their lives revolving around David Lynch yeah. and like how it is to work around him. Mm -hmm. So in that angle. It gives the information. It does its job. It's serviceable. I, I it guess is the Hershey bar <laughs> of knowledge. You know, Hershey bars are good. They are, but I want to watch McCall it. Uh, I want a dark chocolate Hershey bar. Mm. I, like my, I like my dark chocolate. You like your dark chocolate. I, to be fair, I would like it a little darker than Hershey's dark, but it's okay. Just like my entertainment, I like something a little bit more, you know, wild. At heart, almost. So... I don't know how I feel about it as an introduction, I guess, because I feel like it works for us because we've been talking about a lot of these things, so it's a lot of familiar topics and subjects. Yes. But if I had never heard of David Lynch before, I don't know if this would have eased me into the basic <laughs> concepts. Um, so it's not very effective, I think, to a first-timer, but to someone semi-familiar with Lynch, it does fill in some gaps and maybe smooth some things over that might have been unsure Maybe. Then let me dare to challenge you then. Oh, like no. if, if this is a point in which like you're unsure about it, what would be the ideal way to introduce you into David Lynch? Because I don't think that there's any easy way to ease into David Lynch. I don't find David Lynch to be a swimming pool. I find him to be a hot tub. You almost have to dip your feet in and feel the burn for a moment I, before you settle and kind of get used to the feeling. I guess for me, I would look for, you know, we could probably do it in 30 minutes, but like a featurette that goes through the basic information of like, okay, he, he grew up here. He went to like like live in these few places and this is kind of how it affected his work. So like we've talked before, like during the eraser head pod, how kind of he took some of his personal experiences and used that in his films. That'd be kind of cool information to know, know that he went to the American film Institute and that's where he got started with a lot of his short films. That'd be cool to know, like kind of leading you through a little tour of his life and work um, with more emphasis on like major parts. No, I don't. That's what I would normally expect an introduction featurette to be. And that's what you'd expect. Absolutely. I don't know if it'd be appropriate for David Lynch personally. Yes. Just because even, with like David Lynch's style. It would be, yes. <laughs> Even David Lynch's style, he doesn't seem to be the type of person that likes to like dive into those sort of like details, but more so get a like a good feel of something surface level and just rely on almost the paints to paint themselves. In this case, the actors. So you he, he supplies everything, he puts it onto a canvas, and then he tells you, what do you think? And it's like, uh, David Lynch, you're the one who made this. Ah, yes, exactly. Now, what did you think? You know, you say that, but then his biography, Room to Dream, I remember getting my way, I mean, maybe a third or fourth through that. That's pretty straightforward biography, <laughs> so I feel like it's still possible to write or talk about the guy in a linear format. Well, but clearly that was a ghostwriter then. I do not believe David Lynch does anything linear. I think the audiobook had his actual voice in it, but okay, Robot. sure. Robot. <laughs> Deep fake. <laughs> so speaking of David Lynch's personality, we get a bit of his personality through the introduction feature and other things throughout the entire uh, repertoire of special features. Yes. Uh, various cast members weighing in. Michael J. Anderson, who plays the man from their place, uh, mentioned there was a moment in time where they were driving in a car together. Yep. And there was this impatient person behind them who Just really wanted to get by. Up their ass. Really wanted to get by them. And mm -hmm. David Lynch ended up letting the guy pass. And afterward, Michael J. Anderson was like, you know, you're such a nice person, like way nicer than I am. No, I'm not. I wanted to kill that man. No, I wanted to destroy him. Oh, yes, destroy, kill. No, I think destroy is the funnier <laughs> answer. Kill is, kill implies like you're going to shoot him or something. Destroy, and <laughs> like I'm going to take a, like a giant <laughs> press and squeeze down on him <laughs> like he just testified at the Salem witch trials. Like we're gonna, we're gonna, what is his name, Giles? Giles Corey? I'm gonna Giles Corey this man. I don't know who Giles Corey is, but. It's the guy from the Salem witch trials who when they were stoning him, like putting rocks, well, they weren't stoning, they were putting rocks on top of him and they were like, will you confess to knowing that they are witches? He was like, add more rocks. And then they just <laughs> pressed him to death. <laughs> That's what destroy means. <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, <laughs> that didn't happen. Something apparently happens in Lost Highway that may parallel to this, if you will, in which David Lynch directed a scene where, um, 
someone does a similar scenario where they pull over, but yeah. instead as a response, just rides up neck up to the guy. Um, so in, in, a, in a feature we have not yet explored. In a feature we have not explored, but still it explores at the very least uh, a cathartic nature David Lynch might have. How much of his catalog is just him living and through it, things he would wish? It's all speculation. Like, do we necessarily interpret that because this one incident happened with this one cast member in a car where someone, you know, was riding up and then angrily passed him or whatever? Are we supposed to assume that that means that when it happens in the movie, that's a similar situation? It is autobiographical in some way. I, I think that one's a stretch. I think uh, that one's a stretch, but it could be. It could be. I think that in the end, like there's two things that I have in my th- I brain thoughts at the moment. Mm -hmm. One of them is that oftentimes you write or you create things that you're familiar with. So even if it's like a familiar feeling and then it just branches away, I don't think it's one-to-one what David Lynch would want to do. But at the very least, I think that instances like that inspire the work. I think the now, logical mind you, reading. the other thought inside my brain thoughts is that maybe one day, if we are thinking in the cathartic way, the cathartic way, he wants to one day uh, be tossed into a river, wrapped like a flower, and wrapped in plastic. That's what I was know. thinking. Is that the <laughs> the logical thing to do here is read everything that happens in David Lynch's work as autobiographical? <laughs> he has also killed a baby. He has also been moved by strange opera theater performances as an elephant man. He has also gone to planets made of sand and got the spice and been enlightened. These are all things that have happened to David Lynch and more. Uh, Wild at heart, that was all autobiographical. David Lynch, we caught you. If you don't want us to say any more about this, you better contact us at snakeeyedreams at gmail.com or tweet at us at snakeeyedreams, the numeral one, as in, you only got one chance, Lynch. We're coming for you. <laughs> in in podcast format, we only can really do things with our voice. The comments made by the unpub professor are not interpreted to be a threat, <laughs> yeah. nor are they representative of Khalil and the <laughs> Snake Eye Dreams Wonderful Strange podcast as a whole. <laughs> Cheryl Lee has a very special relationship with David Lynch. I mean, the role of L- Laura Palmer is so not only integral to the series and weirdly formatted. Like she talked about how she was first just a dead body in plastic and then would have like flashback scenes, then got to be Maddie. Yeah. Anyway, strange, you know, character. And then fire walk with me. She became this entire thing altogether. But, um, she talked to how about how in the first 10 minutes of meeting David Lynch, he asked her basically like bluntly, like, how would you feel if we wrapped you up in plastic and threw you in freezing cold water? Yeah, sure. Let's go. And, and just kind of insinuated that he wanted to wrap her up in plastic. And that was like a first impression. (laughs) Between uh, her statement as well as just like questions that were given to Rana Pulowski because those two were lined up right. and potentially put into the role like, is it okay if, say, for example, you're in more of a nude situation or anything like that? It seems like uh, from what we've gotten from uh, Cheryl Lee is that she's really gung-ho about the yeah. situation, which <laughs> I, I imagine would be exciting for Lynch. But no, having these sort of like blunt questions um, – and just more so trying to get to know people and mm-hmm. just like in these scenarios and just try to work and feel them out is just, it, it just seems like the Lynch way. The Lynch will. way. Yeah. No, like for example, um, it could be like questions and prying into someone like Cheryl Lee, or it could be say, for example, for uh, Ed, uh, Ed Hurley, big Ed's actor, mm-hmm. Everett McGill, that it would just be a situation where like, you're just having a good conversation with the guy uh, and you're talking about things like mechanic work and so on. And eventually he'll just call you up uh, and just think to himself like, yeah, no, you'd make a great mechanic inside this. Yeah. It seems like almost every cast member that Lynch recruited um, instead of doing interviews, he would just have, well, let's say, I should say instead of doing formal interviews, he would just have kind of informal conversation interviews, mm-hmm. not really an audition in a traditional sense. And he would then oftentimes get a feel of your personality, decide if you're right. Or it's someone he knew from a prior uh, project, prior film, like Kyle McLaughlin, or in, like you said, with uh, Everett McGill, someone he just kind of knew. <laughs> uh, I mean, he did work on Dune with him, so maybe that's how the hot rod thing came up. But yeah. it was enough that when he was thinking of, you know, it's a chicken and an egg situation. <laughs> was he looking for the Big Ed character, thinking of some who was who's an actor I know that knows cars? Oh, yeah, that guy. Or was it, I want to use Everett McGill. What does he know? Cars. Okay, I'm going to make this character called Big Ed. Either way... Mm -hmm. There's that connection between the actor and the role. There seems to be a direct connection, and it also seems to craft almost an emotional connection between them as well as David Lynch from what I've so far experienced. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to ask you, like, this is where uh, someone like Ed then 
takes on a role and then thinks to himself that he's got to be the person that people rely on. They kind of lean on yeah. him to handle this job. Um, I'm so sorry. For someone like Ed, and just to expand further out to the other characters, do you find this technique effective? Do you find that they fit their roles well enough that they're I, given? I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't think I hardly said a bad word about any of the casting in Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. I think that there are maybe some who stand up more than others, but Twin Peaks had a very interesting focus on bringing in, and this is something Mark Frost talked about, bringing in young talent and bringing in fresh mm-hmm. faces. So they most of these people had a few other small roles, but had never been in like a major television production. They had never been in something that was, you know, little did they know was going to become a huge success. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of these actors were untested. Or in some cases, like Richard Boehmer and bringing in Russ Tamblin, you know, both of those two had worked together like in the 60s on West Side Story, Mm -hmm. bringing in talent that maybe hadn't been seen in a while, Mm -hmm. um, kind of that Lynch might have grown up with or remembered fondly. Piper Laurie also was an actor that Lynch had respect for. So I feel like his casting was a lot of unknowns that he struck gold on. (laughs) <laughs> and then a lot of um, familiar ones that maybe he gave a second chance, third chance to, who hadn't really been in the spotlight for a little while. It's wild to just sort of like hear those scenarios. I'm unfamiliar with uh, a lot of just like how some casts can come together. Mm-hmm. But it's almost just crazy to hear like he's got some individuals in which he just calls up and says, hey, you're perfect for the role. That he just like has these casual conversations. Or he goes to the crazy extents that uh, the actor for uh, Dale Cooper. Mm-hmm. Kyle McLaughlin is going to be flying across the States itself uh, to try to check out a role and just kind of be flown around all over right. the place, staying at hotels and going through that fantastical cycle for his overall role. Right. And a lot of these people, again, Lynch had worked with prior where you have Catherine Coulson as the log lady. He had worked with her um, extensively throughout a racer head. She was mm-hmm. doing a lot of the work, even just outside the casting. And then you had obviously Jack Nance who had been in almost everything he'd made. Um, so having him for Pete was a natural, obvious thing. I mm-hmm. think at that point, it's like, obviously Jack Nance is going to be in Twin Peaks. <laughs> it's just, who is he going to play? Uh-huh. I would imagine that's got to be one where he created the character for the actor. I, it, it doesn't say that anywhere in the documentaries, no. but I would speculate that. Just because he'd worked with Jack Nance so much, and he like regrets not having Jack Nance in The Elephant Man, mm-hmm. I feel like the moment he's like, we're doing a TV show, I have to get Jack on the line. <laughs> so I, I like to believe that. It's every sort of conversation, if you will. I'm mm-hmm. going to have potatoes as well as steak for dinner tonight. I have to get Jack on the line. I like to believe that. You know, yeah, someone's got to cut a steak for him. You know, and Jack Nance was <laughs> great with that. Jack Nance using his Jack Lance to cut the steak. <laughs> Jack Lance? Yes. It's a Lance to cut steaks. It's with uh, like Jack Steakhouse. It's kind of the it's a Jack Steakhouse, not sponsored Lance. We might need that Jack Lance to cut into the sandwich, though, that mm. Richard Boehmer was eating at that dinner. Oh, God. Y- you may recall. You may recall, Professor, this beautiful opening Boy. to an episode where he, Mr. Benjamin Horn himself, is diving into a brie and bread sandwich. French bread, brie, brie cheese, that's all it is. That's not hyperbole either. He goes into that. He thing. goes into that, and his brother Jerry's there as well. And when he's biting into the sandwich in the episode, he takes a giant honking bite. Backstory on that. So Richard Boehmer talks at length here about how when he first got the script, it just kind of blandly said, you know, Ben takes a bite of the sandwich and then turns and says, oh, it's very good, right? Something like that. And so he just kind of assumed, well, okay, well, Benjamin Horn, it's like episode three at this point. It's very early on, at least. I don't remember the exact number. And he's like, (laughs) well, I mean, Benjamin Horn's this very formal, very wealthy man, kind of upper class. So probably takes a pretty delicate bite you know probably takes like a pretty formal at a, at a dinner table kind of bite mm-hmm. and then david lynch and just is, keeps the conversation david going lynch like lets to it, not interrupt the yeah, flow no 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 he just takes a bite swallows and then continues the conversation and and david lynch lets the scene roll a bit and then cut 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 okay benjamin mm-hmm. okay okay mm-hmm. Bamer, richard mm-hmm. i don't know what i call you mm-hmm. also i always say Bamer. someone else called it beamer I called him beamer in here and i, I if it, i've been it, saying it wrong my apologies it just looks like Bamer to my eyes it could be beamer <laughs> it's fine i find it humorous this is jumping ahead a little bit mm. but when they were discussing the killer uh they said that the they wrote up three different scenarios, yeah. and it was for Leland Palmer, Dr. Jacoby, or Richard Boehmer. Not, not Benjamin not Horn. Benjamin Horn. It was Richard Boehmer yeah. who jumped well, they, into they, the see, script. Some people say Boehmer, some say Beamer. Who knows? So, so before uh, Boehmer went off to kill Laura Palmer, uh, he's just like, He okay. had to kill that sandwich. He had to kill that sandwich. It. So he's just like thinking to himself, like, okay, okay, you know what? Fine. I'll take a bigger bite. And then he'll just kind of like, and like during this interview, he's stuffing his mouth with a sandwich almost as like a physical example. Yeah. And apparently it's like nine or ten takes later, it's like, no, 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 no. I want you to bite 
into the sandwich. And then it's just like, well, this this is just ridiculous. I don't even recognize this character anymore. So he just like, at this point, just shoves it into his mouth. Yeah. It's like, perfect. I and wanted like, that out uh, of you. On one hand, it is a funny story. How many sandwiches had to die, though? Like, think about well, it. That was a full sandwich he was given. How many sandwiches had to die for this? Just think, though, if the script would have said or David Lynch would have clarified, like, what he wanted from the start, this could have all been avoided. <laughs> Did some interns take away the remaining sandwiches for themselves? Did they throw them all out? Did Richard Boehmer have to have basically a, like, a small truckload of sandwiches sent to his personal, like, place, his apartment estate? Wait somewhere between their range of housing. Well, what happened to these sandwiches, I wonder how many Cleo? sandwiches they had prepared for the takes. Like, what if they only thought it was going to be like a three-take sort of deal? So midway through his, like, third take, they're like, holy crap, we got to get more I'm sandwiches just imagining made. imagining interns are running around quickly, yeah. like, okay, quickly, spread the breed, spread the breed, let's go. Yeah, yeah, they, they can have that guy from Wild at Heart <laughs> come in and make those sandwiches for him. How many sandwiches were prepped for this and how many had to be prepped live? It's, again, it's like, again, it, it's funny story, but it also <laughs> speaks to the idea that I can't tell if Lynch wanted him to get angry because that would create an over the top response. Like he, I don't know uh. if is Lynch a mastermind who said, well, if I put it in the script that he's supposed to eat a big sandwich, he just would have took a big bite. But because I gradually got him there, it became so cartoonishly exaggerated. And that's what I wanted. I don't know. I don't know if it was planned, but it, to me, it, the way that uh, Bamer describes it, it sounds like Lynch should have been more specific from the start normally i don't know i think that i i do believe that this is not to say anything i do think that uh david lynch is an intelligent person i will also say that i don't think he finds it in a point of intellect like for example he's working three steps ahead of people mm -hmm. I, he sounds very much like a go with the flow sort of guy right it's almost as if he kind of like takes the reins of like like water skiing if you will mm. and rides those waves and manages to actually come out well above average and well into his own realm when he's able to pull off some sweet tricks onto that. Yeah, and James Marshall, the actor who plays James Hurley, um, said something kind of similar when they were uh, interviewing him. Okay. He was talking about how a lot of the directors he worked with before and after Twin Peaks, like other directors, uh -huh. um, he found were not very involved in the production, where a lot of times the directors would give ideas on certain takes. They might say, like, okay, we'll do that, but a bit more, or, you know, something like that, right? They give pretty general advice. Mm -hmm. they, they, they do some things on the set, but they're generally not as involved. And David Lynch, by contrast, would notice things even as he's like walking by yeah. and use them on the spot. And like, I know there's a moment where James Hurley is talking about, well, James Marshall, the character is James Hurley. James, <laughs> James, I'll just say James, yeah. uh, was talking about how he was, I believe it was for the pilot, but it was looking down at, just randomly was walking and then David Lynch stopped, looked down at this puddle and was right in front of where the filming location is for the roadhouse, the, the, the bar, the bang, bang bar. The bang, bang and bar. he was looking at the way the neon lights of the bang, bang bar yeah. reflected in the water and kind of just like commenting like how beautiful that is. And, and that's just like wowed James because he was like, holy cow, he just like so in the moment that he noticed that. <laughs> and he didn't end up, you know, he didn't end up using it in like the pilot and like that. No. But there's like that panning shot in Fire Walk with the cigarettes like on the ground in front of the Bang Bang Bar. So yeah. like there is that sense in which, even though that didn't make it in, that idea kind of planted itself potentially. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, James, uh, James kind of noted that too, that Lynch would be very improvisational by nature. Mm -hmm. Michael J. Anderson remembers there was this situation where, uh, David Lynch was just reflecting at, after what he had, um, shot on the camera and he, David Lynch just kind of said audibly, like, that's what I meant. <laughs> like, just kind of like he was then realizing what he had meant by something, Yeah, which Michael J. Anderson called staggering courage. <laughs> Would you agree that that takes staggering courage? Yeah, no, I think that it's very courageous. When you're inside these big productions, it's a lot of money. You got a lot of people around. You're trying to make a lot of people happy all at the same time while you're juggling things around. Or usually the attempt may be to make someone happy. Someone who's a little bit more green might just try to focus on just trying to make things fit all together to try to please as much as possible or try to make their own full artistic vision. For David Lynch... It sounds like he's willing to throw something onto the wall, see if it sticks, and if it doesn't stick, oh well, at the very least, it could be something fun to chew on. And mm -hmm. it seems that, uh, at the very least, there may have been situations where David Lynch didn't realize what he meant, and he didn't have that eureka moment, but he still went with it. I, I think one of the weird things about this, too, is that if, if we do take Michael J. Anderson's account as being like true, like this actually happened, that would imply 
really opened the door, I guess, in terms of Lynch analysis to the question of how much of Lynch's abstractions does Lynch even understand? Yeah. Like, Lynch will say vague things about how Eraserhead is his most spiritual film. He won't elaborate, you know, when you ask him about that. And he doesn't really give any clarity on it. But it makes you wonder, like, does he do things out of just this kind of feeling that it makes sense in an emotional or mood kind of way? Not necessarily having a logical or thematic reason. And he just puts it out there. And then sometime later, he's like, oh, yeah, maybe that's what I meant by that. Or is he more premeditated? Because a lot of times the criticism we do here associated with David Lynch is that idea that he might be doing weird for the sake of being weird sometimes. And I guess if his if there's truly things where he's not even sure why he's doing them, that kind of does lend some credence to the idea that it's not as well thought out. It is kind <laughs> of random. Mm. I would say... Maybe not random. I think random would be too far of a word with it. I think that... Illogical. Illogical, perhaps. He he takes whatever is his version of the color blue and throws it onto the painting uh, haphazardly, mm -hmm. more than anything. And if the color blue ends up sort of like coming out in the painting more of all, he may just say, for example, that this is something that he can feel and enjoy and just grab onto. I think he takes film more amorphously. Mm. than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the same time, even with this sort of flexibility to run with his own impulses, he has a very stringent sense of control. Mm -hmm. We've talked before about Dune and Final Cut, but even with how other cast members kind of were talking about his process, um, Catherine Coulson went on to talk about this example with, I think it was a racer head back when they were working on that in the seventies. Yeah. And David Lynch became frustrated because he just couldn't do anything. He couldn't do everything. Sorry. He couldn't do everything. Yes. And it was frustrating to him because he wanted to do every single aspect of the film. And even to just let her Catherine Coulson handle parts of it, you could tell aggravated him. And so this was involving a situation where it was pudding and how much pudding could fit in a dresser drawer you know, things like that. Um, As you commonly do. Like, Khalil, you know the answer to that, right? Yes. Anyway, so <laughs> uh, that's interesting to note, that there's a sense of, and we kind of noticed that too, that Lynch is a very controlling person, that he will have the idea of impulsivity and randomness and improvisation, yeah. but on his terms. <laughs> you know, sometimes you'll roll with a cast member and their ideas, but mm -hmm. it definitely feels like if he doesn't like the way someone's doing something, he will be very, very clear that he doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. um, there's the situation, I still haven't again watched it, we've referenced it before on the pod, from the return behind the scenes where there was this disagreement, I believe it was Plaster of Paris, but just kind of like shouting at this crew member who didn't you know, bring the right material. Um, he's very <laughs> specific. It's got to be a specific kind of thing. This, you know, something doesn't look quite right. You have to go and fix that exactly down to the specific idea. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a weird mix of random or not necessarily random, but intuitive. Yes. Mixed with very, very purposeful that can get kind of strange to parse through what was the thing that just happened to feel right in the moment and what was the thing that he had down to the most minute detail of what he wanted and it had to be that way or we're abandoning ship. <laughs> and it's it's a mix. It's really a mix. It is. There's also this uh, story during the production of Fire Walk With Me where one of the assistant directors was there in the car with him, I believe, and they're driving by and David Lynch just all of a sudden like stops and is like, Find me that woman's phone number. I need the phone number just of like, that woman. They're just driving down the road and they just see this woman. It's just like, oh, okay, okay, okay Mr. Lynch, get out of the car, go ahead, get that. And, and then the, like a day or two later, he's like, oh, by the way. There's that woman that she had the phone number from. This She's inside this role now. And she's yes, there. And then she was the hot water Carl lady, the <laughs> resident over at the trailer park. Now, what I also find very entertaining that uh, we do discover more with uh, things such as the feature featuring Fire Walk With Me is David Lynch will do one or two different things, it seems, when it comes to instruction. It seems that with actors, mm -hmm. he's a dream to work with. Yes. Like, there's all sorts of fantastic things that happen through. From what I understand from, like, uh, behind the scenes, though, kind of there's people who will say good things about him behind scenes. Yeah. Kind of a nightmare to work with. Like it's, it's grabbing this person over here or say, for example, if you're in the higher up echelons, like inside the producer role being like, okay, I'm funding this movie. I'm helping him out with right. this. Okay. And then David Lynch will just like be working with his director and he's just like, or not the director and assistant. And he's just like, Hey, do you think that it might? And this is paraphrasing, but it is along these lines. How angry do you think that the producers will be 
if I give that person lines. And it's just like, well, you get, we'll have to pay them more money. Let's, great, we're going to do this. Yeah, yeah. There's a bit of that <laughs> that pushback from Lynch to the executives that are funding his work. It's almost as if he in, like might want to partake on just like pushing those boundaries. Maybe mm -hmm. either A is his process or B personal entertainment. I don't know the answer to that question, right. but it still comes into this like strange yet fun personality that is David mm -hmm. Lynch. Mm -hmm. There's also this element that was a bit contradicted about his personality in terms of his shyness. Uh, Peggy Lipton, the actor who plays Norma, mentioned how David Lynch is a very shy man. Mm -hmm. And when Twin Peaks like blew up, became super popular, this was really pushing David Lynch into the forefront. Yes. He had had successful movies before, but unless you were like into film, you probably didn't know the name David Lynch. You know, okay. any more than most people know the name of an average like famous film director. Like, I don't know if Paul Thomas Anderson is a household name unless you are into film, yeah. right? David Lynch was kind of like that. Then Twin Peaks happened, and at least as far as season one is concerned, blew up to such an extent that there were so many interviews and questions and everything coming up that David Lynch became more in the spotlight, and she kind of felt concerned that that was affecting him yeah. as a more shy, withdrawn person. Meanwhile, going back to James Marshall, he had mentioned that David Lynch was different from other directors who were more shy. So I kind of get this sense that Maybe the answer is that when it came to working in his element of production and making the things he loves, making the film, and especially with actors, which are a lot of times like conduits for him, right? Yeah. That he was very comfortable and very in control in his element on the film stage, yeah. in the film set. But the moment you take him out of that and you shove a microphone into his face, you start asking questions... David Lynch doesn't like to give answers. It's more. I, I think that might almost be uh, maybe around like a shy slider or a uh, shy dartboard of whatever mm -hmm. a circle <laughs> analogy would be. Uh, throw uh, the rock at the bottle on the, yeah, gotcha. Exactly. It's a, that sort of shy scale because th at the end of the day, we're seeing all these actors, people who would present themselves, even mm -hmm. production crew, we're rarely seeing David Lynch around. So it either be might be a shyness or interpreted shyness on why we don't see him on the camera speaking about his works more often. Mm -hmm. Or again, his desire to to sort of like not reveal too much and let that sort of like guide He, he does seem generally private and, mm -hmm. and less interested in giving his own thoughts on his films than he is interested in other people's thoughts. Yes. And even then, I, I don't mean, okay, maybe a little cynical here, but I'm not even <laughs> sure how interested he is in hearing other people's thoughts. I think he just wants to make the thing. Yes. I think he's an artist first and foremost. Okay. Um, yeah, and he invites people to think for themselves, but I don't necessarily know if he's up late at night looking at the Twin Peaks Reddit, finding out what people think of his work. Mm -hmm. I think he's he's got to be someone who's nearly immune to criticism at this point. After what happened with Dune and after what happened with Fire Walk with me, I think there had to have been a sense in him. It's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> people don't get it. It's okay. You know what I mean? Like you gotta have a you gotta have a thick skin after a certain point because yeah. David Lynch didn't stop doing those things. It's mm -hmm. not like you know after Fire Walk with Me he stopped being dark. Well, and weird. maybe I should change my perspective around. You know, rework things so it actually is towards what everyone else. No, it doesn't ever seem like that yeah. ever happened. So if anything, he redoubles. <laughs> and Take that, that! I'm all in. And that brings us to the sense of uh, mystery that David Lynch oftentimes connotates. So he would kind of seem to go out of his way to confuse actors. Mm. Um, you know, part of it's just not wanting to give answers, and also part of it might be to see what the actors themselves come up with. David Lynch also might not know the answer himself based on the things we've been told. <laughs> but um, Michael J. Anderson would talk about how whenever he asked, like, what his character is or what the context was or what the motivations were, David Lynch would be very dodgy. And part of it, again, is because there was no context to the first Red Room scene. It happens out of nowhere, <laughs> David but, Lynch, like, there's no such thing as a scene that doesn't have context before or after. But that's the problem also of character motivations. It's not like he was telling, you know, that the man from another place is a good person, a bad person. What is his What is his goal? What does he want out of Cooper? Like, none of those sort of things seem to have been factoring in. It leaves it very open for the actor to interpret, okay, well, what is this? It seems like a lot of the overall, not maybe the physicalities, but more so on how, like, someone sort of embraces the personality of the character seems to be very actor-led. There's a reason why he's set up the interview such as, like, in this way, because he's already gotten their personalities 
and has captured them, Gremlin Cell, and has put them into his works. He knows who, who he wants inside that. He knows he wants those bits and personalities. He's just not going to try to then recraft you into something else, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. So since he knew that he wants that guy in there, he knows he wants him to do this thing, he's just going to try to encourage him to go down that path. If not, make it extreme. <laughs> right. Which, by the way, uh, there is actually something very uh, funny. There is an interview done with Kyle McLaughlin mm. where he was told that he needs to uh, uh, have a need a wind and a little more like Elvis when uh, being approached by David Lynch uh, during one of his reads and so on. Which I find humorous because what if also Nicolas Cage got that advice mm. and it's just the different limitations on how far you take wind and Elvis, whether you get wild at heart whoo, or you get uh, just more so of a casual calm but still a uh, cool person like Dale Cooper. I, I never would have thought Elvis with, with uh, Kyle McLaughlin's uh, Dale Cooper, but <laughs> interesting. But still, it was, he needed a little more wind and a little bit more like Elvis. Hmm. Uh, also, Jean Renault's actor, uh, back when Fire Walk With Me was being made, there's that line about the great went. I remember we speculated about I that line. Great, yeah, mainly you speculated. Mainly me, it. probably. And you should be proud because basically <laughs> there was a lot of that aspect of the great went that went. He was... Someone who was gone. And that was something that seemed to be led by the actor. Right. This is not David Lynch saying this is what your character is. This mm-hmm. is, you know, the actor kind of having to figure it out for himself. Yes. Same thing happened with the blank as a fart line. When he asked David Lynch what the line meant, David Lynch was like, what do you think it means? <laughs> and uh, he's like, I think it means something different to everybody. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> and then that's the conversation. That's good. Pat him on the yeah. head. <laughs> so it, there is this sense that... I. He treats the actors very well, but I could also imagine some actors getting frustrated with that process. Frustrated or intimidated. I think he found a group of people that worked well with it, but I also could understand an actor being like, please give me more of an instruction. Something, David Lynch. Something Something tangible. But he always manages to get them on his wavelength, you know? Like, even Nicolas Cage, he only, you know, as far as we know, maybe he'll appear somewhere later, but as far as we know, he's only been at Wild at Heart so far. He's not in Twin Peaks. Yeah. And... Even from that, I've heard Nicolas Cage talk a lot of positive about David Lynch, even from that role specifically. Okay. So uh, a wide range of actors of various different levels and career stages uh, like that approach and find that it's so hard to find any other director who's quite like him in that way. Yes. And then part of the mystery and confusion also with him is that he'll give weird instructions. Okay. Uh, this is all, a lot of times to the, the not the, the cast, but the crew the people who are assisting him in making it. Uh, back mm-hmm. to that assistant director for Fire Walk With Me, one day he just kind of told him, seemingly out of the blue, um, have a monkey ready tomorrow. <laughs> and didn't explain why, didn't explain anything beyond have a monkey. Apparently these timelines weren't uncommon either. It was no. something in which like he would just need something and you had no plans for a monkey, so you had to figure out a way to get a monkey in here. And then the monkey was incorporated into Fire Walk with me with the whole situation of, uh, you know, Judy and the scenes above the convenience store. Whoever was the monkey wrangler and had to figure that out for the day. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you, man in the yellow suit for Curious George's presence. (laughs) Also, kudos to the people wrangler who brought in all the cast members. They didn't do traditional interviews a lot of times. It was just kind of conversations. Yeah. Uh, Dana Ashbrook, who plays Bobby Briggs. By the way, just seems like a cool, casual guy in the interview. Just seems like a fun guy to talk to. Uh, He was talking about how he actually knew Kimmy Robertson. Uh, She's the actor who would go on to play Lucy. And both of them around the same time were looking for just a steady job, like a TV show. They're sitting back, relaxing in a bar just like man I, I, steady work would be, would just be fantastic yeah not doing commercials not doing like one off little specials like doing an actual show mm-hmm. and then like three weeks later out of you know pretty much luck one would suppose yeah uh, I, they both end up on Twin Peaks Dan, Danny Ashbrook actually like heavily leans into that and believing that it is heavily influenced by luck which is a fair assessment to have mm-hmm. when you're in that sort of business it's very hard to just sort of like rise up to fate any level fate and coincidence figure largely in our lives fate and coincidence yes they do, they do. I still think that uh, Danny Ashbrook you do fantastic your ability in combination with your luck did you well did you well uh, Ray Wise the actor for Leland Palmer or as the special feature called it Leyland Palmer <laughs> Leland Palmer. Spelled differently, said originally this- that he wanted to be Sheriff Truman. <laughs> 
And if you think we might have mentioned that in a previous episode, I don't remember. Maybe we did. I'm pretty sure that we did uh, mention this in one of the mm. lookbacks, potentially. It's fun because a lot of the trivia we found inside of the interviews were likely sourced from, from yeah, these. Yeah, because I, I looked at a lot <laughs> for the lookback episodes. I was looking at like IMDb trivia, and a lot of the IMDb trivia clearly came from this. Yes. Uh, which is fine. And, and a lot of it just kind of redoubles the accounts that give it a little more oomph to believe. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he wanted to be Sheriff Truman at first, which would be a, you know, a totally different range. And I guess that one thing, you know, if we didn't have crazy killer Leland later on, it'd be easier to like buy into this because Leland for most of the show up until the point where he's revealed to be the murderer is a pretty stable guy. Um, yes. however, however, once the range is shown, I couldn't imagine anyone else being Leland because he just did such an amazing job. No, I think he did an amazing job, especially with the opportunities that he gained, uh, even post And the Leland. fact that there wasn't like an audition, it's not like Lynch had ever seen him go full wild. Unless he did that in a previous role Lynch had seen him in. There's no reason to believe that this man could pull it off. He just kind of knew. He just did. He just did. He did really well. And again, and Ray Wise did not know he was going to turn into that. Absolutely. So I'm very thankful that Leland happened to be that because I think that he did the role heavily well. Yeah. Now, I've got to ask, just out of curiosity, mm. while we're going through these interview processes, right. or even these special features, where's Sheriff Truman? The actor yeah, Michael for Sheriff Onkian. Truman. I, I, I was wondering that, too, because other than David Lynch not showing up, Michael Onkian is probably one of the big ones. Um, also, the actor for Donna doesn't show up. Yeah. Um, which there Doc was all, Hayward, a lot of other like bigger characters. Yeah. I, I would say that, um, Donna, I won't. Donna's look, pretty big. Donna is pretty book, big. What I'm getting at is that I'm not too surprised kind of just because of what I've heard so far. There of, like, seems complications. to be some bad blood that might be there. Yes. Speculation. Only yes. speculation. Spec- only speculation. But Michael on Kean is, is a tough one. And I, I'll have more things to say about that later. Okay. I, I guess what I would say for right now is I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that Michael on Kean's Sheriff Truman for a lot of people, myself included, is one of the most <laughs> quintessentially important characters and roles. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say it isn't Twin Peaks without him, but he is a big part of the chemistry, especially when we're bringing in Kyle McLaughlin. Yes. So it is, it is very strange not having Michael on Kean there. And I would have enjoyed having more of his input because I don't remember seeing him in any of the other special features really either. Yes. He wasn't in the interview section as much and he's not in the documentaries now. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know the answer. He might also be a private person. Maybe. Cause these, these, these documentaries were made over the years. Like some were in 2000, some were in like 2006, some were in like 2013. Like there's a range of time here. Yes. So uh, it's not like it's one day, one sitting. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. I, I don't, just know, don't either. know. I enjoy also the fact that you say that you'll have things to say in the future, but you also, you do not know it. it, it the duality of thought inside that it makes me curious. Like what secrets do you still hold in? There? I, those who know <laughs> what I know, know why I don't know, but I do know <laughs> that I have things to say. And those who are following live alongside with me, I feel your pain. It's gonna be this okay. This is a live podcast. We're gonna get we're gonna get through all of this. Um, <laughs> and, and going back to Leland just for a quick moment, uh, Ray Wise when he's looking through the script, he just saw all the times that Leland cries in the pilot. Like, and yep. even past the pilot, like early and episodes, he cries. This is just a man who cries. And he cries. And he cries. And again, Ray Wise very good at doing that. He did good crying. Good job. Good cry. It's good to cry. And a lot of the actors, you know, who are wanting that sort of stable job, I think it's interesting because on one hand, like, you know, Dane Ashbrook was like, oh, it's good luck that I got this position. But also there was never a guarantee this is even going to be a series. Like when they first signed up for the pilot, it was more than likely going to be a one and done. Mm -hmm. Um, Piper Laurie, the actor for Catherine Martell, talked about how usually when you have a pilot, like like just a pilot in general, how few make it into a series, let alone a pilot this weird. Mm -hmm. Like by, by nowadays standards, I don't think the Twin Peaks pilot seems that weird. Like, there's things in Twin Peaks like the Red Room in the international pilot version that seem weird, I guess. Yeah. Like, the Red Room is never normal, even by today's standards. But, like, the idea of the TV drama with a bit of comedy, a bit of whatever, it's still unique, but I wouldn't be like, this is unheard of in all of television. But this was a time in TV where this thing did not exist. This was before X-Files. This is before Lost. This is before, like, TV dramas like The Sopranos. Yeah, if we think in the context of the time, I, I would call it weird because... Oh, no, in, that's what I'm the, getting at. Yes. It's like, nowadays, if there was a pilot like that... I would compare it to other shows that exist because it's been so influential. Yes. You have things like Psych. You know, you have things like... um, Psych Season 2. Psych Season 2. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You have all these different shows that straddle that line. 
even the good place, which I never really got into, but like yeah. shows that are dramas that are willing to tackle interesting subject matter in their own way. Like I, comedy. I forget the reference, but I remember there was a distinct Twin Peaks thing I told you about there too. With Psych? So, no, with the good place. Oh, Psych had a Twin Peaks episode. Oh, good. We can we can see like Twin Peaks branching out. Yeah. Uh, whether it is people either just like sharing their love of the unique flavor that is Twin Peaks, uh, or if it's just like continues to be influential to this day from different directors and so on. Twin Peaks still gives something that is Twin Peaks trademark more mm-hmm. than anything. And no, I do think it's a testament to A when it came out and B what it was willing to do. Mm-hmm. For sure. Speaking of uh, Twin Peaks. Speaking of Twin Peaks, the podcast. <laughs> the podcast you're listening to right now. Uh, uh, a big part of Twin Peaks' success beyond the casting and the crew was the music. So yes, absolutely. Angelo, Angelo Badalamenti Angelo has Bottle one Lamenti of the best featurettes in here. One of the best parts. It's beautiful, beautiful person as far as I know, which what I have only been exposed to this yeah, overall. We haven't found the bodies in the we basement, haven't... so we're going to assume he's a great <laughs> let's guy. Not, let's not go for the bodies at this point. He seems like a genuinely like fun guy. It seems like when I look at this person, it makes complete sense why David Lynch was having a great time working with him. It makes sense why we're hearing great things from people like Julie Cruz about him, because it seems that he takes a lot of joy when it comes to music unless he's an amazing actor on top of it he gets down sits down on piano and retells the story that you had once told me in a very high high sort of pitched david lynch voice the and wind I, the trees yes, laura palmer it is so much more personal and so much more engaging when you actually hear it straight from him and as he's like straight from the horse's mouth straight from the keyboards as he's just exploring the notes and you see this guy just get lost whether it is just from general mental memory on what it's sort of like made beautiful at this time or if these are instances that he shared with Dave Lynch just having that creative process of just sitting down and playing with these notes it this 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 person as someone who enjoys the act of sound mm-hmm. and that act of art uh it's it, it's just mm, it is chef's kiss it is chef's kiss from what I'm getting from this guy. Also recounting something that I believe I previously had said in a look back episode, Angela Badalamenti recounts the story about Paul McCartney and the Queen of England. That's a story that comes up inside this interview. And I've got to say, just like him having the chance to sit down with Paul McCartney and literally like Paul McCartney just like gives it, like, it, unless like he's throwing Paul McCartney under the proverbial bus. And just like, so that Paul McCartney can't get up and say, Hey, that special feature that you were a part of, that's not true. Like, he's going to take his time for that. (laughs) I'm going forward assuming that this tale is then confirmed because it does nothing for Angelo Badalamenti otherwise. So to recap just very briefly here, there is a story that feels very urban legendy to me where supposedly Paul McCarty was going to perform some music for the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, and... Sheev's like, oh, that sounds lovely, dear, but I must go watch Twin Peaks right now. And Paul McCartney <laughs> it's was... It's about that time, It's you about know. that time. Time to go to Twin Peaks. <laughs> bye, 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 bye. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Why did she turn Scottish? I don't oh, know. let's go. I don't know. Let's go up the stairs now. Uh, let's go. Uh, but, <laughs> she, she sounds much nicer when you put that voice in, but I'm uh, so horrified. But, but but Paul McCartney was, like, mad about that later and, like, punched Angela Bottom into the arm. Says some select English words. Yes. But that's the thing, like, you're getting at, though, is, like, it sounds like an urban legend, like, oh, the Queen of England watches Twin Peaks. Enough that, <coughs> enough that you wouldn't talk to Paul McCartney. I'm dying. You would try to say this. <laughs> that sounds outlandish. Like, that sounds like such an exaggeration. But it's coming from Angelo Badalamenti himself. And unless he's lying about this conversation with Paul McCartney. Which he might ruin his relationship with Paul McCartney and or the Queen. And that's bad. <laughs> that's bad. So I I don't know, man. I, I guess it's hap- I guess it happened. It's either happened or Paul McCartney's a liar. Or Paul Angelo McCartney. Badalamenti, all, uh, Angelo could be a liar. Paul McCartney, please be free to uh, defend yourself or Angelo Badalamenti or the Queen, either of you three, by emailing us at snakeeyedreams.com or tweeting us at snakeeyedreams1, the numeral one, as in one of you three should figure this out and just come together with a singular story. Although a more minor role in the series, not necessarily a minor role in Lynch's career, uh, Julie Cruz. Uh, also yep. spoke a bit in these special features. Julie Cruz, uh, to remind the audience, is uh, the singer. singer at the Roadhouse in a couple episodes of Twin Peaks, as well as she was featured in Blue Velvet and yes. heavily in Industrial Symphony Number no. One. Yes. So she's the thing about Julie Cruz that I appreciate here is that she took the time to go to the location of this shoot. Yes. That she decided, you know, hey, I could 
I could very blatantly green screen myself in in a way that is jarring and hard to watch because my hair is going to look <laughs> like it's phasing in and out of reality. Or I could go to the location that's being filmed and she chose to do the latter. I'm going to go forward and say this is very likely green screen. It is green screen. Very, very, very likely green screen. It is green screen. It's not, a, it's not Unless likely. Unless the lighting is extremely no. Unless she's wearing fake hair that has white pixelization on it that doesn't blend with environments. It could be in. This could <sighs> be the style. And the, the lighting kids are on her body nowadays. is different than the lighting in the background. Look, I'm not. I'm, I'm making a joke. It's not her fault. I'm sure it just was a situation if she couldn't get to the location. I just thought it was very funny because almost everyone else is either there or it looks very convincing. Mm. And then there's just this person hologrammed into the background, <laughs> and it's just funny to me. Um, yeah. So Julie Cruz talks a bit about her side of things, uh, making music with David Lynch and how she would get the lyrics from David. He would write them. Yes. And she would just feel overwhelmed a lot of times. Like she would just start crying about how sad the songs are, but also because she would have to do so many takes to record them that at some point she was like at the point of breakdown where she would throw chairs. <laughs> she, yeah, threw she threw a chair chairs in the recording area. And David Lynch was like, let's calm down now. That's not right. No, no, no. He, he said something much better than that. Yeah. It's like, Julie, I don't appreciate your attitude. Yeah, that was what he said. Yeah, you're right, you're right, right, right. <laughs> Um, it's it's far like the most mild of scolding. Yeah, and it's like funny to hear about that, except for the fact that it really did seem to put a strain on her. Yeah. So eventually, it came to a point after they did their two albums together and multiple film and industrial symphony projects. She felt uh, that she couldn't do anything like creative, like like because yeah, she songs. couldn't. She wasn't writing her own. She was having David write her stuff. Yes, yeah, she was mostly a performer, and that was just uh, stifling to her. And by her terms and her words, she felt that uh, when you do get more recognition, you start to build an ego and so on. And eventually, that just culminated, bubbled up until eventually there was just a burning out and just like they went they didn't talk to each other for what seven years yeah seven years of radio seven silence. years and then just one day like julie picked up the courage to just call uh and try to get a hold of david lynch mm -hmm. in which apparently david lynch ran straight to the phone yeah and uh she's just like david i'm i'm so sorry with what happened mm -hmm. uh, it's just that over time it's like no julie no julie i'm sorry it's like no david i'm sorry no julie i'm sorry david <laughs> I'm it's, David. It's nice Julie. to have a happy end. It's it, nice to hear that they did, you know, patch things up. It's nice to hear that they patch things up, but I do. There's something that is very endearing and just fills my heart whenever I hear just like two people just trying to come to terms with what's happened, but both of them will not relent on feeling that they were at fault. Whether it, yeah. whether it was like David Lynch feeling guilty about the situation, not calling up, or Julie Cruz picking up the courage and just like coming forward with it. Those two bouncing off, it, it, it just, it's just one of those like little Hallmark cards, put in a card, give it to me. It's so nice. And I can also see it happening, though. I, I, could, I, I, I agree. You know, when we weren't we weren't there to say why and, and who who's more in the right, blah, why, blah, blah. I'm who, not going to I'm not going to speculate. Yeah. But I, I also can understand why why she would be frustrated yes. and want more creative freedom. And I also understand he'd be frustrated because they had a good working relationship. And now it seems like she kind of wanted to leave that. So I could see both of them being frustrated. Yes. Speaking of friends of David Lynch. Are you okay? Mark Frost. Um, <laughs> are you fine? <laughs> I don't know what in, I don't know what sort of Borg just sort of introduced themselves to Khalil in this moment. <laughs> I'm still working out um, this. No, please, Khalil, continue. Mark Frost. I slapped the microphone. <laughs> So Mark Frost, uh, he's he's an interesting character. Yes, and and you know since we've been looking at the works of David Lynch, we we haven't been looking at the works of Mark Frost. No. Um, so at some point, if our podcast lasts an infinite amount of time, there are things that Mark Frost has worked on outside of Twin Peaks, but also inside of Twin Peaks. I I have never encountered them to my memory. I don't think I've ever read or watched anything Mark Frost has been involved in outside of Twin Peaks. Yeah, I'm most familiar with him directly through his work on the books. Yes. Um, so I, I can't say myself uh, a lot about his involvement beyond what we see and hear in commentaries and direct director stuff like this, like in the documentaries. Yes. Catherine Coulson, log lady actor, and so much more, <laughs> says that Mark Frost is kind of an unsung force behind Twin Peaks, that uh, he did create a lot of the story. Yeah. And mostly just let David Lynch's imagination run wild in terms of how to make that. Yeah. Right. Um, David Lynch definitely would improv things in the moment and would definitely have a vision, but a lot of the story people will claim to Mark Frost. It seems that a uh, Mark Frost from what I'm seeing, say for example, in the book so far of like 
because I'm trying to flip through the pages of the book so we don't have to wait a few months. Well, see, you have been reading Secret History. I wasn't sure. I've been flipping through Secret History however much I can with the time I've got. Yeah. Um, But no, it seems that he's very history-oriented, lore-oriented. Yeah, that's kind of the idea that I've been getting to. Mythology, lore, history are are oftentimes the things that that are attributed to him. Yes. So I would speculate, you know, how much of the stuff with the lodges might be him, you Mm -hmm. know, is is a question that I would have. So I guess my question that I had written in my notes here was, what impressions have you got on Mark Frost so far? Um, Impressions on Mark Frost? Beyond what you've already said, yeah, if there's anything else. (laughs) Beyond what I've already said? He's got a nice working relationship with uh, David Lynch, it seems, Mm -hmm. uh, over time. It seems that there's a nice sort of, like, buddy relationship with them. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that just due to from the general nature of being the more probably noted as the more analytical one between the two, uh, the one that seems to be um, more present, uh, dishes out the details of what happens on the director's end, I can't get much on Mark Frost's style from his dialogue or what he's even spoken of. It seems that also he doesn't really talk too much about his personal work, just more so his time being amongst others mm-hmm. inside of Twin Peaks. That's true. So as far as him specifically, I'm not sure. Now, again, I'm kind of in the same boat. I mean, he seems very well-spoken. He seems very articulate. He seems very knowledgeable. Yes. He's not nearly as aloof and secretive as Lynch is. Yes. For, for worse or better, depending on your taste. He's, less, he's more of a straight shooter. He's more of a straight shooter. He's someone that, he's not like the direct director. He's one of the individuals involved with just more so the crafting alongside mm-hmm. with Lynch. So he's not the one that's going to be in the actor face so likely that's where also we're not getting as many stories from. right right he, he was more on the writing side than necessarily with the actors so yeah i think unsung hero is most certainly a good descriptor for mark frost mm-hmm. there's uh some talk in there about how he and david lynch would bounce ideas off each other during the writing process especially during the pilot and a lot of it was like they had a vague outline and then a lot of it was just scene by scene even line by line just kind of bouncing things back and forth um, Mark Frost would be the one to always type. Yeah. Because he, as he speculates, uh, David Lynch said that he didn't know how to type, but Mark Frost also commented either that or he professed not to know. So Mark Frost even leads the idea in the interview that um, maybe David Lynch was just saying he didn't know how to type. He's not even quite <laughs> sure. He might not, for example, know how to type. Not in the, like the literal sense, but just more so in the broad sense of being like, I could try to like type these down and put them into words. But Mark, you do it much better. Mm-hmm. You're the one who makes the books. Here you go. And and Frost also was the one to map out the area by the sound of it, that he had drawn this map of the area, and that's how they got the name Twin Peaks in the first place, mm-hmm. is because they looked at the town being located next to these two mountain peaks. Yeah. Humorous to say the least. How so? <laughs> I'm 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 just thinking about places in which for the most part as from what I've seen cities to be named off of, mm-hmm. usually there's like someone very important in the history that they either A, want to impress to make sure that they give them money or B, just kind of show a sense of pride, if you will, for mm-hmm. their overall area. I see towns just sort of like named after specific events that had occurred or anything like that. But to say, we got two mountains around us. I know name. Twin Peaks. Yeah, I, I don't know many in real life examples. As, as compared to like Austin, Texas, named after the legendary Austin. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, specifically Fargo, depending on how far you will go to get to it. Or Phoenix, Arizona, known for its resurrection. Or New York, known for its resurrection from being from York. <laughs> yes. Exactly. All these just silly city examples that are blaspheme. Regardless, I find like area descriptors to be humorous, but it's so fitting. It it rolls off the tongue. It's something you remember immediately. And not Northwest Passage. Northwest Passage is a forgettable name. It's I a don't good, think so. It's like, a good name. Well, that was it's not going to be the name of the town. Name. That was be the name of the episode. It's going like to be the name series. of the series. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that just Twin Peaks worked in a good, large naming sense. Yeah, I, I really I really would have liked the name Northwest Passage. I, I do like that name. I'm, I'm, I'm quite so, 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 happy with so it. What, so, what, so would you rather have, like, a nice little t-shirt that says... Twin Peaks, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in that, and it's just like, there's a lot of high sounds in it. Or do you want something like Northwest Passage, just like scribbled onto the t-shirt and so on? I realize I'm I butchering guess Northwest, this. Yeah, Northwest Passage, honestly, is what I'd prefer. If I had to go down just by the, the feel of the name, I like how, Northwest Passage better. How dare also, you? I feel like if you're wearing a shirt that says Twin Peaks, it's more liable to, like, be used as, like, a joke, like, you're showing off your Twin Peaks, like, like, in your chest. I like humor. 
I'll show off both my Twin Peaks. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, not on the podcast. <laughs> not, on the, not on the podcast, Professor. It's audio. Why this can't is, I show this, this off? This podcast is rated PG-13. Uh, no, it's not. I don't. We're unrated. Well, it's it's somewhere between one and a hundred. One and a hundred. <laughs> somewhere between one and a hundred is the classic movie Rebel Without a Cause, which yes. Mark Frost says that he wanted to recreate the feeling of Rebel Without a Cause mm-hmm. when picking the the movie's cast, when yeah. going for those young talent and fresh faces. Okay. I haven't seen Rebel Without a Cause. It's eventually on my list. <laughs> but I, I kind of get what he's saying. Yeah. And I think, again, it was a smart move. It is a shame that I, I, and a lot of these actors didn't... I mean, I say it's a shame selfishly, because I would have loved to see more of these actors and things. But a lot of the actors that were in Twin Peaks, I don't think went on to go to a lot of big, big projects. Mm-hmm. A lot of them, Twin Peaks was the biggest thing they were ever on. And they did amazing in it, which, again, it's like, oh, I wish I could have seen more of them. But don't worry, Ray Wise <laughs> is in God's Not Dead, I think, two. So if you want to see him in, like, a, I, a Christian propaganda I film. I don't want to see he's God's He's in Not there, Dead. though, and he's like a God-hating lawyer. I don't care. It's... <laughs> That's what I mean. Is like, like, it like been... you, uh, here's the thing. I'll bring up Kitty Mamas. You will and bring I up Kitty Mamas. And I adore Kitty Mamas for what sort of like craziness that yeah. is. I draw the line at propaganda. Kitty Mamas is cat propaganda. <laughs> I don't know why you cat don't think pre- it is. Yeah, you know, we propaganda to get human people pregnant with cats. Of course, how did I not see beyond the nuances? I'm not sure we've ever explained the premise of Kitty Mamas. No. So now you've just weirdly alluded to it without giving proper context. And I like that. Let's not explain it. Let's not explain it. It sounds really bad out of context. It sounds slightly better in context. Still bad, but anyway. It's a fun time. Uh, fun, fun note. Mark Frost says they'd written up most of the areas, most of the major areas they wanted, like yeah. the diner and, the, and all that sort of stuff before they found the area of Snoqualmie Falls. Yes. So when they got to the location and found the giant waterfall, found this diner, found this area that looked good for the bar, like a lot of it just kind of fell into place. Yeah. To the extent that it's like they they wrote these things into existence. It seems that they wrote a lot of things into existence and it seems to be fitting, which seems like strange, mythical, and miraculous. Fates and coincidence figure largely in their lives. They can, and I think that that's great. But on another regard, I'm just thinking to myself how crazy it was for... And it's not uncommon for productions yeah. to be filming all over the place. Say, for example, uh, the interiors and exterior right. shots were wildly different. One lodge inside of uh, Washington uh, off like miles and miles away in this direction. And one lodge that's sitting over the waterfall. Two different areas, but we're to assume that they're the same place. Yeah, through and the that's magic just, of video editing. And, and, and never minding the fact that a lot of these locations in the pilot were shot for the outside areas in Washington. But then when they were working on season one, a lot of the in, a lot of the stuff had to be done like in studios in like yeah. Los Angeles, so they have to create that illusion that it's one world, and I think they're very successful, very well. I I, I never doubt as I'm watching it the the realism here. When in reality, there's a lot of like really, you know, there's like this big warehouse where they have like multiple sets. That you, I could imagine the feeling how out of body it must be to walk in there <laughs> when you look to your left and there's the Great Northern Interior. Then you look a little bit forward and there's inside the Hayward House, and it's just you know what I mean, like all the different places. <laughs> It's got to throw some people off who are more familiar with the spots around the time of the filming. Right. Not to mention uh, the fun scenarios where, like, a paper mill was near, uh, was where the sawmill was, and that office that was nearby the sawmill was the police station. Yeah. Which is also just a wild sort of, like, back and forth situation to consider. Speaking of wild back and forth situations, David Lynch. Was he back and forth when it came to Twin Peaks? Is a debate that scholars are still speculating to this day. I imagine it's maybe by scholars by some definition. I don't know if it's like how big this is. Previously on Wonderful and Strange Z, Frieza was about to shoot a, a spirit bomb toward the planet Twin Peaks. There goes the plot. But Dale Cooper readied his away. Kamehameha and shot his Kamehameha through Freezer's left temple. I'll miss you. Meanwhile, <laughs> Krillin died again. Now, um, previously in the Wild at Heart <laughs> episode, we had talked about how David Lynch mm-hmm. reportedly uh, Partly. would have left Twin Peaks to work on his film Wild at Heart, right? Yes. And this is a very, very strange situation. Wonderful. Debatable. Mm. Peggy Lipton, Norma's actor, talked about how David Lynch was around quite a lot in the beginning of the series, 
and then he was around less often later in the show. And she said they missed him terribly and they felt that absence being gone. Similarly, Dwayne Dunham, the guy who worked with David Lynch on editing Blue Velvet, Wild yes. at Heart itself. Yes. And also the pilot episode of Twin Peaks. Yes. This guy who would also go on to work on every episode of The Return with him. Okay, he's clearly a Lynch collaborator. Yes. He said that David Lynch mm -hmm. was distracted by Wild at Heart during season two. If we go by a lot of accounts from cast and crew, right, looking at Peggy Lipton's insinuations and Dwayne Dunham just clearly stating it, it would sound to us as though David Lynch was absent from season two largely because he was working on Wild at Heart. Is that fair to read into what Dwayne Dunham is saying and kind of what Peggy Limpton is, is maybe insinuating? While also juggling a few things inside of my head as far as timing-wise, yeah. yeah. Now, here's where it gets interesting. It's going to get interesting. We received a comment on Twitter, a tweet tweeted at us at Snake Eye on Dreams the, 1. On the Twitter. Snake Eye Dreams, the numeral one? The numeral one. As in? As in one comment that I think is quite interesting. Mm. This is from the Blue Rose Task Force podcast. Blue Rose, that sounds awfully familiar. Quick shout out, by the way, to John Bernardi in the Blue Rose Task Force podcast. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. They mentioned, quote, FYI, you got snookered by that fallacy about Lynch and Wild at Heart. Snookered, you say. He actually filmed it right after the pilot mm. and finished before he filmed episode two, okay. which means it was season one he was mostly missing for. If the timeline matches up that way, right? This is me talking, not him, by the way. Yep. If the timeline matches up that way, that would mean that Dwayne Dunham, the guy who was literally editing Twin Peaks and editing Wild at Heart, has that timeline wrong. Has okay. timeline wrong either by a memory, memory. Or it could be something in which it's an just agenda. Like misspoken. Who knows? It could just be lies. <laughs> Downright conspiracy. <laughs> Treachery. Regardless. The Blue Rose Task Force podcast tweeted further. It's largely overstated, referring to the absence of David Lynch during season two. Though around the same time that Frost needed to leave, about a month for pre-production on Storyville, Lynch also had an art show, and this is where he said, I believe, in Japan for a few weeks. I think that happened right until Cole could hear Shelley. So maybe it wasn't wild at heart. Maybe he was gone over with this art show in Japan. Mm -hmm. He had other projects. A big thing that uh, ended up being thrown in about David Lynch is that some believe that TV show is a different beast and needs a different form of collaborator with mm -hmm. this bit of media that has to like fully de push and dedicate themselves. While David Lynch probably also wants to like work on other creative endeavors and wants to like explore more with himself and make other things and make other movies, which makes sense. And the last reply they said was quote, it's easy to be mixed up about this though. Both Lynch and his agent, Tony Krantz promote the, quote, he left season two to film Wild at Heart thing themselves. It's just verifiably false. Okay. So this is pretty wild at heart, one mm. could say, right? Mm. That Lynch himself, Tony Krantz, and Dwayne Dunham, and all these other people seem to be telling this version of the story that would neatly portray Lynch's absence in season two as a large part because he was working on Wild at Heart, his feature-length film. Yeah. But... If the timeline doesn't match up with that, if it really was happening around season one, I mean, granted, there's a lot of post-production and there's a lot of um, work that is to be done after the film was shot. Maybe it was, you know, involved in um, advertisement, distribution, like promoting it, all those different things, right? Even then, it seems like kind of pointing at Wild at Heart is getting away from what really might have been the factor. Yeah. And, and I don't know about you, Professor, this is where we're entering that realm of extreme speculating, is that... I get the sense yeah. that David Lynch, because he was dealing with television, he wasn't used to that medium. Yeah. He was someone who wanted that control, fought for that control. When he felt like he wasn't getting it, when he felt like the show was kind of running away from him, I think he kind of just left. And and I and I mean this could be this could be wrong on my part, but mm -hmm. I feel like David Lynch was obviously very frustrated about revealing Laura Palmer's killer yeah. midway through season two, a little earlier than midway. And I feel that once that reveal happened, he was kind of a wall until the last few episodes with, you know, with Gordon Cole coming back around that time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we can simply point at wild at heart or even the show in Japan as like one singular excuse. I think his heart wasn't in it anymore. Mm -hmm. That's my sense about it. Um, Mark Frost, I guess I feel less knowledge about what is your take on this whole discrepancy and, Lynch's seeming uninvolvement. I think I touched on a little bit beforehand uh, where 
he's someone that is not going to be able to fully dedicate himself as much as other items. He wants to do like his work and his art. Like you brought up a good point earlier in which if he's given less control and it seems like the executives are coming more in on it, right. and he gets this other tantalizing offer elsewhere in which he's able to st- be able to express himself more in a different way or with mm-hmm. like other people or with other sort of like opportunities. I don't see why David Lynch needs to stick around, but I'm also the person in the last pod that ended up saying Twin Peaks doesn't need David Lynch. Which is one of the most bold statements you could say, and I appreciate it. I think it. that he's done fantastic work, and I think his legacy lives on well with it. But I do think that it's okay for someone to move on from the work. I don't think that David Lynch needs to be married to Twin Peaks. And this is also touching upon, I think, a very interesting aspect of development with with Twin Peaks is that from very early on, other writers and directors were involved aside from David Lynch and Mark Frost. Yes. And we've we've done our part to try to recommend and and kind of talk about them as we went through our episodes. Um, But it sounds as though... ABC at the time and give really give an almost unprecedented um, access and free reign to David Lynch and Mark Frost to the extent that like they basically had total control. He got as close to final cut as you're going to get to a TV show at that time. Mark Frost told them that they need to have this control. Because ABC was desperate, right? It it was like at the bottom of the polls. The the narrative would be that ABC took Twin Peaks on as a bold, risky idea because what did they have to lose? They were already losing at that day in that time slot anyway. Let's put something different on the air. We like what you gave us with the pilot. And they let Lynch and Frost have that. So it's kind of crazy. And and one could say wild at heart is that <laughs> I'm gonna keep making this joke forever. <laughs> is that David Lynch, if he did just leave, because you know, again, the the you know, revealing of the killer, it sounds like revealing the killer was one of the very, very, very few constraints put on him as this TV show ensued. It's a major changing of the show, don't get me wrong, but it sounds like everything else was pretty much up for debate. Or it's just like they were medial at the point that's no reason to really bring him up, especially when it comes to something as big as their golden goose. Right. And where this gets really wild at heart. At heart. <laughs> I'm never going to stop making that joke. Where this gets really wild is that the show was... Always from the start, it sounds like, very director-focused, and not just for David Lynch. No, it seems that there were, like, ways in which the other directors were able to use the deal made with uh, Mark Frost and David Lynch, maybe even encouraged. Mm. Actually, no, absolutely encouraged. It even was stated at one point. Yeah. Where you can just explore yourself, just, like, make this episode really your own. Like to, the, to try- the point where they basically considered them like stand, not standalone films, but like you're making a one hour film set in the twin peaks universe. Yes. There's points where you'll go straight into like a Raven's eye or just like an atmosphere from mm-hmm. a hole in the wall. And it becomes something what many cast and crew and people will say, uh, made it fa- feel more film like than any, anything else they're seeing on TV. And, and David Lynch directed, I think, in my opinion, some of the best episodes of the series. Yes. But it's only a small number of episodes. He was not the main director of Twin Peaks. Yes. He was the creator of the pilot with Mark Frost. And he directed some of the most important episodes, you know, in the series. The Killer Reveal, the final episode, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we're talking about Twin Peaks, it, it feels as though oftentimes we look at only David Lynch when all these amazing writers and directors were involved. Yes. And like you said... From the beginning, it was very much intentional. Mark Frost said that he wanted to give directors creative latitude on the episodes, that he was never disappointed with any of the directors in Twin Peaks. And this statement was made in the documentary during a season one section, but he didn't specify in the quote that it was only season one. Mm -hmm. He said he was never disappointed with any of the directors involved in Twin Peaks. That would imply to me season two, which... I sense a little bit of friction, I guess, a little bit of tension yes. in the sense that Frost has that stance and then David Lynch has the stance that the show went off the rails and became, like, bad. Like, he speaks pretty clearly that it's not good hmm. after, you know, the death of of uh, Leland, after Leland was revealed as the killer. Okay. And and you and I have gone back and forth on this a bunch, for right now at least, because we're <laughs> things are going to hit hit the head further later. Okay? <laughs> for right now at least... I just think it's really weird how when we're listening to the creators, they have these like conflicting narratives about what even happened. Absolutely. That on one hand, it sounds like David Lynch reads this as a show that went out of his control and went off the rails and went bad and made all these decisions. And then Frost makes it seem like it was kind of part of a, 
an ongoing loose plan to let things be more on the fly. Mm -hmm. And if we don't even know why David Lynch and Mark Frost were less involved, um, it it could be because of their other projects, but it's also not 100% clear. They were already opening the door for other writers and directors to be involved. My cynical side tells me that 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 was all fine until Lynch didn't like what they were doing all of a sudden. Hmm. But it did. It was never only David Lynch's baby. It, t- it took a village to raise this child. It, I would say, yeah, it's not it, like they may, it may have been birthed one day from these individuals. David Lynch birthed that baby with Mark Frost there as the wet nurse. And there's a point of ownership one would obviously feel from that. Yeah. It's just, yes, I do think that a lot of people put their hands onto it and then got a chance to engage with it. It's just a question of who do you point your finger at when it comes down to the most frustrating angles of season two. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm thoroughly excited to get into deeper when we get more into the reception. Yes. By the way, one of those uh, fun director, uh, what are we going to call them? Um, Handprints on the series. (laughs) Sticking their hand on the wet cement and and indenting it. Sticking their bloody hand on photographs. Uh, Shoving the pillow over Jock's mouth was uh, Leslie (laughs) Linka-Glotter. She apparently was the one who started this trend of in the background having there being conventions at the Great Northern, um, which I never really thought about. Weirdly enough, and this is where there's always more to discover in Twin Peaks that I just wasn't picking up on. But through so many episodes, there was just in the background, anytime they're at the Great Northern, like if, if Cooper was having, you know, coffee with Audrey or they're meeting about something, there's just a convention. And it started off pretty normal. It was like this Native American like convention happening. Yeah. And then it became like these cheerleaders or something. And then gradually you just have more and more bombastic ones in the background. Yep. And uh, yeah, she just kind of started this and other directors decided to jump on board with that as well. I mean, I've never found an instance where I wasn't just grinning at the overall scenarios of just how active the Great Northern could become. Yeah. It, it's something It's a that, fun little detail. It's a fun little detail that makes sense. This seems like a place in which people would go out to, not necessarily to live like Dale Cooper mm-hmm. may, but more so go into just so sort of like engage for some time here, either visiting to see the other school mm-hmm. or if it's just to get away from it all. It, it, it's a nice detail to make yeah. things such as a lodge more lived in. And again, I've heard people and read people Talk about Twin Peaks as though everything that's quirky or weird or interesting about it is all David Lynch. And it's like, this is a prime example of something that wouldn't have existed if Lynch had made all the episodes. Mm -hmm. This is another person's idea. Another person's bloody hand in the cement. (laughs) Another person's thumb in the soup, one could say. (laughs) Speaking of thumbs and soups, Cooper really wanted to put his thumb in Audrey's soup. And uh I I'm still here, listener. Yeah. I somehow didn't walk away from the mic Cooper, microphone from that. Cooper really wanted to put his thumb in Audrey's. We suit. all heard you the first and time. I don't know if they did because I was laughing too much during it. So um that's a thing we've talked about before, right? About how it seemed like for a while they were angling the Cooper Audrey relationship. A lot of people have weighed in about why they think it broke up and what happened and blah, 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 blah. To, to be frank, like, it seems that Audrey uh, was leaning in more, like, how, like, her involvement ended up lessening. Kyle did admit that Cooper found her sexy, but still didn't feel, like, comfortable with, like, le- leaning in yeah. on that angle. Sherilyn Fenn thought it was a good idea for her character. And Sherilyn Fenn is someone who seems to be very outspoken for her character and kind of her character's direction. Yes. Kyle McLaughlin, or as I called him in my notes, Kyle Mack, uh, did, didn't <laughs> like it. because he, did, he thought that it was kind of inappropriate. If he's supposed to be an FBI agent, she's a high school student. He just didn't feel like it was right for the character. Uh, I'm on team Kyle Mack with this one. Uh, just going by how they word it, um, I don't think it would be the right direction for Sherilyn Fenn's character, and I don't think it would be right for Kyle McLaughlin's character either. And and we can hash out more why if we want to, but what I'm more interested in is Frost's kind of input here, right? So Mark Frost says that he had wanted, he had wanted Cooper and Audrey to be the next thing for Twin Peaks after the reveal of the killer, which I think is a very strange move. Like, we're going to lose our hook of who killed Laura Palmer. What's the next best thing? Spicy romance between the FBI and the high school girl. I get it. It's very, again, it's very TV, right? I get it. Yep. It's just weird because I can't imagine David Lynch, like, feeling the same way about that. (laughs) It doesn't seem like a David Lynch angle. Um, And Frost, all he says is that... Well, now does it sound like a Robert angle. 
Ha. Ha. And Mark Frost says, like, for reasons I won't get into, it didn't happen. He does okay. not specify, which leads further speculation about Laura Flynn Boyle and her involvement. Who knows whatever else? Caleb Dachanel, who apparently is my eternal nemesis because I had some beefs with his words in the last uh, last Pistol Features podcast. Yeah. He said that uh, he had some great ideas for Audrey's character. His two suggestions is they could have had Audrey get pregnant or die. <sighs> I'm you know, physically the, wincing at this. The two ah. good options for this strong female character, pregnancy or, or death. death. And like, it's like you and I, Professor, we disagree about things. We butt heads. We, we, oh. we, we, and, and I don't know if listeners, how much we think we agree. Professor and I agree on most things with Twin Peaks. Yeah. We, we have some fun discussions in, in now and then. But I we're have both more look, right opinions. <clears throat> of course, the professor's more deluded. But it's at the end <laughs> of the day, we're both on the same page here that Audrey is a more interesting character than pregnancy or death. Because and I here's also, the thing, those things, those things seem to be only connected to woman. Because so far, it seems like the focus of death has been woman-centered, and it seems to be something in dramatic Twin Peaks, due to in Twin female. Peaks, yeah, they're or the victims. pregnancy, which is just very woman-centered whenever it comes to, like, plots for something like soap operas for TV. I get where it comes from. I'm tired of it. I think that, and I will die on this hill to say that I want special agent Adrian, Adrian, we're going with that anyway. Audrey Horde. No, There's and, enough and set up for it. There's enough a character interest for it. We can do more with a character beyond woman. And I'm I'm not necessarily saying it's be special Adrian, 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 Adrian mm. special Grant. Um, but I do feel like they already had this side of her that they were exploring where she wanted to emulate Cooper for attention and kind of for his 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 noticing to try to investigate for herself what was going on with Laura by infiltrating her father's business. And it felt like for a while, there was that moment, right, where she was rescued from One-Eyed Jax and she was on the cusp of exposing her father for all of his wrongdoings. And then the Civil War happens and she just kind of stops that. And they turn her into the side character for Ben Horn's plot and Bobby's plot line. And then John Justice Wheeler happens. Now, I will give a little bit of defense to John Justice Wheeler. I don't hate John Justice Wheeler. I know he's not a beloved character by everyone. But I think it makes sense that Audrey would be drawn to him. This outsider who is very mysterious. He can take her to places she's never been before. He's knowledgeable about the world around him in a way that maybe Cooper would be too in her eyes. I can see why she would have an appeal in that guy. I at least think they're giving her something to work with. But even then, the best they could come up with after we got past one Eye Jacks was daughter, Bobby's romance interest, or John Justice Wheeler romance interest. What happened to the personality elements of Audrey in season one and early season two that were really good? They dropped motivation. They dropped motivation because all that she had to do then was just be a supporting role, which I think that Audrey's personality is strong enough to take yeah. the reins. She is she is a stronger character than just putting her with Cooper would make her out to be. Yes. I, I, I think that that would be really flat for her character. So again, this is where... Putting her with Co Cooper romantically, I would say. Yes, I still no. think they're a great partner. partnership and they you can have like a would they will they won't they kind of thing you can tease it I don't mind that I think there's something to be said about that but I don't think Cooper the way I know his character I don't think he would go after this high school girl mm -hmm. and I also don't think Audrey is going to pursue that knowing his moral code I think that that scene we both really liked where Audrey is in Cooper's um, hotel room in the bed and she's not clothed and he like basically has to handle that situation to me that was the defining fork in the road where they kind of understood each other from that point on it was a point of mutual respect for one another and being up and Cooper coming forward as a friend saying right. I'm gonna get you some food we're just going to talk this out everything's gonna be okay that does so much for Cooper's character. Yeah. And I can't imagine like a scenario where like, it's just like, it's just thrown under the bus yeah. just because of not like say for, I don't know, whatever, like black lodging. I also, I also think it's funny him. to look back on uh, that moment in time where Audrey almost formed a partnership with Donna over investigating. They're in that bathroom together and they like have this mutual agreement to like investigate different angles of the Laura Palmer case. And then <laughs> never again, never again. Do they ever speak Donna, again? Okay. This is actually, I gotta, I gotta say this. <laughs> Donna's arc is better than Audrey's in season two okay. because Donna got the Harold arc. And I actually, and, and the Maddie stuff. And I gotta say, 
That's good. And I think it works for Donna's character. The whole like, you know, I can't bury you deep enough line that I love, you know, at the funeral scene, it kind of carries over into the actions that she's still living in Laura's shadow, that she's still pursuing the Harold situation. She's still around Maddie and James. I think that works for Donna. Mm -hmm. So I think that Donna had a better arc in season two than Audrey, despite the fact that if you ask me which is the character I like more, it's a pretty obvious win for Audrey. (laughs) And I think Audrey is the more interesting element, but I think they just didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where, again, we're talking about killing the golden goose, right? Everything seems to be blamed on revealing the killer of Laura Palmer. And I call nonsense on that because Mm -hmm. there were so many good characters and good plot lines that Twin Peaks had other than the killer. Yes, the killer was the main one the tabloids would talk about, people would speculate about, and for good reason. It's a good central mystery. Mm -hmm. But they had other things going on, and it's not like the moment that they found out Leland was the killer, we have to suddenly take Audrey's character and throw her down the waterfall at the Great Northern. (laughs) Like, that's unrelated. They say that if you stare at the waterfall enough, like, the rocks turn upside up. And I'm pretty sure that also counts when you're falling. Oh, no, I feel bad for Johnny because he's always there doing target practice. And and all of a sudden, Audrey descends. Um, uh, But but in all seriousness, though, it just it frustrates me when a lot of the blame for season two's, you know, whatever problems that people think it has. Yes. Is put on this one reveal where it's like there are problems in season two. I agree. I just don't think it's all on this thing you think is the problem. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's fine. You're all entitled to your opinions. It's a TV show. We welcome disagreement. I just feel like Audrey's character got hurt for reasons totally preventable mm-hmm. that had nothing to do with that. Absolutely. Anyway, that was a rant. <laughs> it who, was needed. Who killed Laura Palmer? <laughs> who killed Laura Palmer? <laughs> John Wentworth. I lost, this, I lost who did kill Laura Palmer. I'm too upset about Audrey. <laughs> John Wentworth feels similarly. It was really funny. There's this <laughs> moment where John Wentworth, I think it's like one of the only times he talks. In all of the documentary featurettes we looked at, John went with the guy who was in that slice of Lynch. He was one of Which the... Which is another part of the special features. Yeah, in, in our, in our uh, episode about the interviews, right? Yeah. Slice of Lynch guy. He just appears, I think the only thing he says, or one of the only things, he comments about how he said, I still don't know who killed Laura Palmer. In like a section of uh, sequences talking about that event. I think that's compelling. It's compelling and also very funny. Like I, he didn't get to explain... It's just him saying that out of context. Yeah. So we don't know his reasons why he said that, but that's an interesting answer. <laughs> it's an interesting answer. Ray Wise, the actor for Leland Palmer, you know, he noticed all the hubbub, as he called it. He said, as great as all the hubbub was, I was just praying it wasn't me. So hey, flash buddy. forward, flash forward to a situation where, at least according to Mark Frost's memory, it was calling in Leland's actor, Ben's actor, and Jacoby's actor in a room and just saying the killer is in the room. Uh, obviously it's not Mark Frost. So the killer is in the room. Okay. Hypothetically speaking, that could have been like the turnaround to just like keep them on their toes because Mark Frost is the writer. It could have been none of these people. (laughs) So (laughs) this could have still been true with Mark Frost. Now, now to trick a bunch of actors. I I have have not been beyond that. It was switching up scripts. Fair. I I have, uh, I've heard before and, and talked about it before that Ben's actor had been given indications that he could be the killer to the extent of shooting a scene where he kills Maddie. And I, oh, what I would give, how many lives I would destroy. How many? How many Audrey's I would throw down you, the you're, waterfall. You're putting all these hypotheticals out. How much 17 would you pay? and a half. Se- d- <laughs> monies, bodies, or Audrey's? Yes. And <laughs> I would give so much to see the Ben Horn scene, right, uh, with, with Maddie. Because it'd yeah. be so interesting to see. But to me, in my mind, when you have Ben, Jacoby, and Leland in the same room, and you tell me one of them's the killer, to me, it's obviously Leland, because Ben and Jacoby just seem like clear red herrings, in the sense that Ben and Jacoby, if they're the killer, it's like, yeah, okay. Like, Jacoby <laughs> Jacoby is the shadiest person around, and then Ben Horn is somehow even shadier than the shadiest person around. And then there's Leland, the father. <laughs> so I'm going to be thinking, if he's not the killer, why did you bring Leland in? But if Jacoby was the killer, he could have a tie for the occasion, you know? Yeah, he could. He really could. But that's what I was going to get at, though, is that, you know, as much as I would throw 17 and a half Audrey's down the waterfall to God, get the sea. No. As much as I would do that, no, I would throw like 500 Audrey's down the waterfall to see Jacoby's killing How scene. How many Audrey's have to fall? Tell me you wouldn't want to see 
You wouldn't want to see that situation of Jacoby looking in the mirror and like working, fixing his like hula girl tie the same way that Leland does and having Bob stare back and like, I want to see Jacoby go full Bob. Like, what does I that can, look like with that actor? I can see like the close up going to the hula girl as the skirt sort of sways as yeah. he settles the tie. As the, as the record enough, player is skipping. I can see pieces of this. It's... A fun series of ideas, but I think I've told you on my train of thought, I don't have to give anything. I'm enjoying the ticket price that I've already paid to be on this I'd also ride. be curious, you know, we never really told, you know, if Leland's killing happened in the Palmer household, <laughs> did Ben and Jacoby also show up at the it's Palmer household? The Palmer to household yes. That's what I'm wondering, you know, because I mean, I'm trying to think of like what the reason would be. I mean, to be fair, Jacoby... Jacoby, if he was the killer, he recently had overheard the Jacques incident over at the hospital with Leland. He recently had been tailed by Maddie and James. He would have a reason and excuse to be there, potentially. Reason and excuse, or he could just say, for example, A, he could have someone, like, either do a check-in with the overall family because, mm -hmm. you know, psychiatrist. Uh, he could just call in Maddie and just, uh, like, have a chance to sort of, like, speak to her because he reminds her, she reminds him of Laura Palmer enough uh, to be bamboozled. Uh, so just like inviting her in to have a conversation, especially like it's hard being around mm -hmm. um, these situations. Benjamin Horn would have to pull some strings. I don't doubt he's able to pull strings, but yeah. he's got to pull some strings for just like either A, a house visit or B. Hey, Maddie Ferguson, why don't you come over to a free stay yeah, at the Great Northern? Again, I go back to the idea that if I was looking at the three people in the room, it would be so obvious it's got to be Leland because the other two are just like silly. It's like too obvious. It's too easy. If you it's pick someone them. in the shadows. Well, I mean, if they it, snuck someone in behind them, and there's just Bob, just like smiling in the corner. You, you, you took like the two most obvious red herrings, and then put in an unlikely, shocking answer. And I'm like, which one would David Lynch pick? Okay, then huh. here, carry me out here. Here's your hypothetical question yeah. of the second time of the week. Yes, is. Who would be, like, two other people that you would put into the same room to be potential okay. Laura Palmer killers? So you obviously have Leland, point, yeah. yeah. Leland and then two more likely else could people. could seem like a red herring, depending on what scenario you that's put a very, in. That's a very good question. Um, I feel like... Here's your fish in the percolator. No, your this, row. Is, this is really good. Um, Catherine Martell. Interesting. Because she does have connections insofar as her dealings with Ben... And her, maybe she wants to, like, psychologically mess with Ben's lawyer. Um, also, there's the fact that with Josie, she was, uh, Laura was tutoring Josie English. There could be more to Catherine's angle than we would know. And I feel like it'd be an in. Uh, I also was thinking Josie herself. But at that point, Josie wasn't as suspicious as she would rapidly become later in season two. So I don't she know. She's going around everywhere going bang, bang, bang. I think alternatively, you know, this is going to sound wild. And it actually relates to an inside joke that you and I had uh, been making prior. You know where this might be going. Andy. Insofar that if it was a room with Leland, Andy, and Catherine Martell, I would be looking at all three like, what? <laughs> like, I'd be like, <laughs> one of you killed Laura Palmer. What? Like, it'd be a very strange, because, like, the moment you're looking at Leland, you're like, but wait Andy's in here is it Andy like it'd be <laughs> such an outlandish thing that it almost might be true now here's the fun bit about this though even introducing these people and their motivations you still fall into the same problem as Jacoby as well as Ben where would Maddie have to be where would we have to put the clue <laughs> okay, piece of okay, Maddie Andy to could put easily, them here Andy could find an excuse to visit as a law enforcement agent he, he, he's been over at the Palmer house numerous times to get information and also to talk with Sarah Palmer I, I'm willing to believe he could find an excuse to be at the Palmer household if we wanted to have it be that way Catherine that's a tricky one I don't have an answer for that I have better answers Okay. It may not be thematically the greatest. I admit there's own flaws inside this, but we've got to think to ourselves, connections to Maddie. Sure. People around Maddie. People who can be also around Laura. People involved in that scenario. And there's only two other characters I can think okay, of that Okay, two other that characters mold. that fit that mold. That's going to be Norma, and that's going to be, even though we haven't met him yet, little Nikki. Little Nikki comes in early to kill Laura Palmer. James and Donna. James and Donna. Yeah. James and Donna, I the thought people about who are close about them, that uh, overall we could say something. Because at the, <laughs> the, at the end oh of the God. day, oh Bob God. is still a force that can play with memory, as we've seen Professor, before. the line, I couldn't bury you deep enough, or they didn't bury you deep enough, really hits different if Donna killed Laura. Exactly. 
<laughs> no, that'd be a good one. And again, all of those are still better than putting Ben and uh, Jacoby in the room. <laughs> I, and I, I, referring back also to the inside joke, the inside joke I'm talking about with Andy is that you and I made the comment to, to each other off pod that it'd be funny if every single cast member was told that they killed Laura Palmer. What? Every single one. Like Laura's actor is told, yep, they, they die by suicide. Donna was told, yep, you killed your best friend. Leland was told he killed his daughter, but everyone was told. So everyone is so everyone is <laughs> acting their scenes as though they're the killer. Yes. Every single actor <laughs> in the show thinks they're the killer. <laughs> and I think that'd be a very funny atmosphere. And then I'm, I'm thinking of Andy where it's like, wait, I, Andy, Andy <laughs> killed Laura. <laughs> <laughs> just where do you think the tears came from Andy yeah it was from your regrets uh and we were we were kind of going back and forth with the idea of he <laughs> did the killing and I could just imagine like he calls from the Palmer household Lucy pumpkin I need you to come over to the Palmer house right away <laughs> mm-hmm yeah like with Laura and then, like, she has to dispose of the body or something, like Lucy and Andy <laughs> running their shenanigans in the town. Oh, God. Um, yeah, no, I, I all jokes aside, yeah, I think that... I, I think it's really interesting to look back on who the killer could have been because once you know it's Leland, it, it felt like it had to be that way. But when the actual reveal happened, it still would have been shocking. Um, to even come up with who else it could have been is hard to do. Uh, <laughs> so this raises the question, you know, was it planned? You know, was Leland always going to be the killer? Mm -hmm. So it sounds like yes, right? Like from what Ray Wise said, like he was told, I believe by David Lynch, like it was you, it was always you, like that sort of idea. He's like, oh God. Mark Frost said that he and Lynch knew Leland killed Laura from the beginning. So like this was always intentional. So even though Ray Wise wasn't auditioning as a murderer, when they were hiring him, they were like, yep, this guy is the one. Or the example of the book of The Secret Diary of Laura Palmer, mm -hmm. where it's like, you are one of three people now, my daughter, that knows who the killer is. Which I think is wild than that internet, wild at heart, by the way, that international pilot, um, they don't reveal it then, even though they would have known. If we're going by their accounts, they would have known the actual killer's Leland. Mm -hmm. But in the international pilot ending, they don't go that route. Yes. They just kind of like don't talk about that. They kind of leave it to be maybe it's a symbolic Leland through Bob or something. We don't talk about Leland. No, 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 no. We don't talk about Leland. But. So depending on how popular Encanto is in like two, three years, if someone's listening to this in the future, that's either going to be a very yes. relevant joke or... A lot of people are really like condemn music. It's still the best song in the movie, and yeah. everyone agrees. Every single human being agrees. <laughs> no one has disagreed yet. Um, <laughs> Harley Payton also said something I think is quite interesting and, and something I want to chew on a little bit here. So you make that, the surf slurping sound. Yeah, is that, yes, David Lynch had wanted to wait, but... Peyton thinks that they had a plan and they had stuck to it. That, yes, Lynch wanted to wait longer, but they were always going to reveal Leland as the killer. Which is, again, super interesting that someone so involved in the production makes it sound as though, yeah, we would have done it later, but it was going to happen. It was a plan. It wasn't random. Which is just like flying in the face of like Lynch saying he was never going to reveal a killer. I don't know, man. That's weird. <laughs> That's weird to think about. You and I, I think, still have that position, correct, that at the end of the day, we don't know what the show would have been if the killer hadn't been revealed, but Never you and I are still of the opinion scenarios. that Leland being the killer is one of the best things that ever happened to the series I, because of Ray Wise's performance, because of what it did for Laura Palmer and the Palmer family's characters, because it gave way to fire walk with me. Personally and selfishly, yes. Like, I, I can't imagine the killer not being revealed because it's one of the best moments in the series for me. Like, it, it, it's something that I would not get rid of. Like, I just, I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So, I don't I guess I'm glad <laughs> David Lynch didn't get his way this time. Put it that way. Previously, someone had mentioned Fire Walk With Me. It might have been me. <laughs> Sounds like you're ready to flirt with the yeah. listener. <laughs> was it me? Was it not? So, a certain Angles by the name of Robert <laughs> had been a had been, had a, been a naughty boy. Had been a co-writer <laughs> for uh, Fire Walk with Me, and uh, he remembered there being a script where he said it was all Cooper, referring to the parts that later would go to Desmond. It was all Cooper at the you know for the first like half hour. All Cooper all the time. It just was heavily Cooper, Cooper, Cooper. And from what we already heard so far is that everyone who ended up coming up uh, for 
like watch like being part of the movie said yes to being in the movie it seems like a lot of people were excited except for laura flynn boyle as donna (laughs) except for laura flynn boyle as donna who they kept sending scripts to and she was like no i for reasons we can only speculate about yes and then there came a script later because kyle mclaughlin said he wouldn't be in it it was all desmond and then kyle said yeah i'll do it sure and then it became a script that had both. It seems like uh, it seems like for the most part, it wasn't until like Cooper could be taken off from it mm-hmm. to not be the focus yeah. of it, being more Laura's story rather than the Twin Peaks or like Cooper pops in story, which is which makes sense. So I guess my question for you is like, let's say that they had gone with Kyle, Kyle McLaughlin said yes right away, and it was Cooper in the Deer Meadow section. Right, I that's what we, I assume would happen. We're I, we're going to go off that assumption right now. I think we covered this a little bit in our uh, pod beforehand, but no, it, whether or not like there was more Cooper inside it, I think exploring the other agents was the smart idea. Okay. And it seems like these uh, people in production also agree it was the smart idea. They were able to explore more. Now, would you have gotten rid of Cooper altogether then? Because all get, Cooper is really doing in here is he's at the Philadelphia office, and then he later follows up with like Carl Rod and such at the. Deer Meadow area. I think that a youthful young eyed Cooper and being like dipped into this sort of like paranormal instances is fine. Could he be replaced by someone? Hypothetically, maybe. I don't mm-hmm. know. Do I appreciate him being there? Yeah. Do I think that he needed to be everywhere plastered around? He is the one agent? Nah. Honestly, it makes then the corporate, not, not the corporation, the FBI Asian, uh, seem much smaller. smaller. Yeah. I can, I can get by that. So short answer is no, you wouldn't get rid of him, though. I would not get rid of him. Okay. I, I'm, I'm okay with him being there. I, I would say I for sure want him in the red room. The little bit we get where he's like, Laura, don't take the ring. I like that a lot. So I'm cool with the idea that it, like, bends time forward and backward. You know, yeah. is, it, is it future, is it past kind of situation? So I like his involvement in the red room. I do see, though, that with how they portrayed it here, they could have just done more of someone else. That would have probably been fine. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I, I can go either way as long as he's kept at the red room. Parts. I enjoy the potential dip into the fact on like we, we again, however it wants to be interpreted or however David mm-hmm. Lynch wants us to interpret it. It seems that we've got the playground here uh, of assuming if Cooper even is inside of that FBI room. Right. Uh, that's also, do you just know funny. who this is right yes. here? Cheryl Lee also brings up that at one point they were going to have a scene where, uh, well, they already had the scene with Bob slash Leland over her on the bed, like a very yes. uncomfortable scene already. But in the uh, an earlier version of the script, and they had actually made the prop for this, there was going to be a pig head on top of her at one point. It was first going to be Bob, and then it was going to turn into Leland, then it was going to turn into pig head. And she drew the line from her account because that was just too much to this bear. This was the first time she says that she's told no to Because there would Lynch. be a, a pig head on a stick directly above her, like an actual dismembered pig head. Good, but good. Which I would draw the line too because that I couldn't do that as an actor. That'd be crazy. No. Um, on that note, though, do you think that that was a smart move to get rid of the pig head? I think that there was enough balance between the two that uh, if you were to incorporate the pig head, it'd be a strange element to incorporate, maybe mm-hmm. even just a little bit humorous to incorporate. But I think that the overall mood of dread is much more special better when you include these two familiar yeah. characters. Don't bring in a foreign agent in that case. Keep it to the what we know, because people who are coming in, very likely the majority of the audience will be people who have experienced Twin Peaks, experienced these characters, and then when this sort of hits, that's when it hits hard. I agree with you. I think that the pig head would have been silly, like you kind of said, in a way that I think the humor would hurt it. Um, it would be initially horrifying because if it's like a jump cut, you don't expect a pig head right in your face as the viewer. Yes. So I think that could be disturbing, but at the same time, it takes out of the reality. You're already having to suspend your disbelief about Bob switching back and forth with Leland. You already have to suspend your disbelief about that. I think adding the pig head just makes it feel like not sensationalized, but it makes it feel a little too over the top. Mm-hmm. Um, There's some very over the top moments inside of this. There are that points shouldn't be like, one of them. That that's that's my argument. I think it hits harder on a personal note that this Bob character is her father. And this is what's happening is such a real and horrible thing on its own that to try to dramatize that with the pig head feels just not right Mm-mm. to me. Um, and, and as I was kind of listening to Cheryl Lee talk in a lot of these installments, she does a lot of talking here. Yes. It just, you know, like, I know that this is a hard role to do. Like, I, I've always kind of intellectually understood 
that like it would be hard to be Laura Palmer and fire walk with me, but it doesn't really sink in that often until I kind of stop and think about it. Like imagine being Cheryl Lee and having to do like multiple takes of these scenes. Like, you know, if everything was done in one take, it'd be exhausting and, and harrowing, right? Hi, but I was the one very exhausted just watching it. So Hello. Just being in that, constantly being thrown into these states, there's a reason why she had to take a vacation after this. There's a reason why she had to step away because by the gods would that just be like, just imagine flying into yeah. that character. She said on account with David Lynch before that when she's walking into the role, uh, she has an expectation, but usually that gets overflown by like what we're willing to dive into for the role. So knowing that you're going to go into a bad situation, having it become much worse and falling into a character that is miserable. It just asks so much out of her, you yes. know, and, and thank God that like, Cheryl Lee, you deserve that vacation. You well, just, I'm just saying like, this could have been bad. Like this could have really very had bad. trauma for her. And it sounds like she bounced back. It sounds like when she thinks about Laura Palmer and her time being Laura Palmer, she's internalized it in a healthy way where like, she personally resonates with the story of Laura Palmer and kind of looks back on that time as important and special and doesn't seem to be, you know, deeply hurt by it. Thank goodness. But yes. it, it, it really could have gone the other way. And that that's also where the ethics come in. Like, did Lynch ask too much out of her? I, I guess what I would say is that I think Lynch got to know her enough to know her limitations and know her lines. And I think that he came dangerously clo close to crossing them. But I, I feel that he and Cheryl Lee pushed against their comfort zones and made something you don't normally see. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's, I think it was risky. Like there were, I think it was Cheryl Lee who talked about other staff members kind of worried about her, like other crew, because of like what they were, what she had to do over and over again for multiple takes. Yes. But I think that they both kind of knew when to say no, you know, when, when to stop it. And the fact that she cut out with the pig moment, she wasn't, she had some agency there to stop things. We can only hope for the case. Again, she seems to be someone who's gung ho enough for a role and so on that she's yeah. willing to. And she's continuously push spoken positive with Lynch. So. She spoke positive with Lynch. And that again, that's, you know, we, we oftentimes will be kind of cynical and questioning about Lynch sometimes. And that's, that's in all fairness. But I think this is one of the best testaments to Lynch's power as a, like a director is the fact that he was able to work with her through this. Like, you have to really trust someone. To if, if they're going to make you do all of that. I do believe that that is the case. It's just the fear if Lynch is wrong. That's what point. I mean, but he wasn't. He and wasn't it's wrong. it's also the fact that she trusted him enough to go that far. Yes. Like, he is, he is the kind of person that actors are willing to go to those dark and deep places, not just her other actors, too. And that takes a special kind of trust that he's able to inculcate in people. We can only hope that that trust and the overall ability with that continues. Because, again... All the scenarios where everything yeah. turns out good, the one time it does not turn out good is still something to take things. Well, into and that's question. why the thing with the pig head, it, it it kind of it helps me a bit with my peace of mind in the sense that this means that he listened to her. Fair. This means that when it came too far, you know, the actor was empowered enough to say no, and he was able to listen and respect that. Because Lynch again is a stubborn guy. He's a stubborn guy. <laughs> he knows what he overall wants, and but he tends I think to the safety of his actors comes first. I really do believe that's his priority. Very well. Um, Ronette, kind of a different story here, but also in the matter of respecting their interests, uh, Ronette's actor remembers remarking how the script was so sad when she read it. And when, uh, when she said it had no redemption for anyone, that apparently Lynch listened to that enough to add in an angel for Ronette, which if that's the reason the angel was put in, that also kind of says he's listening to the actors uh, in, in ways that maybe you wouldn't expect that, the angel wasn't originally planned for Ronette. Mm -hmm. There is a darkness to that though. Like the angel helps Ronette, but not Laura. You know, there, there is a kind of a, a thing you can angle with that. That's still kind of sad in its own way, mm -hmm. but it gave a sense of hope and redemption and, you know, something good for someone in a time in the film where there wasn't much goodness to be found. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was an interesting anecdote. Oh yes. Now it's not dark. Now it is not dark. Speaking of angels. No, no, I'm not doing that again. Speaking of angels in their outfields. I'll let you do that one. I'll let you keep that one. No. Why? It's no. funny. It's funny. <laughs> Here we go. Where are we safe? <laughs> because what? Is the outfield the success? Yeah. Did someone catch a fly ball back here? Yeah. 
You still recording? Yes. Good. It's never stopped. Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of angels in the outfield, <laughs> yeah, um, the actor who played the angel at the end, right, that, that Laura would see, she interprets the character as representing the angel at the table in the picture on the wall, which is kind of my assumption, too. Mm-hmm. But the fact that the actor interprets it that way, I think adds a little bit more credence. I don't know if that was based on something she was told by Lynch in a rare moment of clarity. Yeah. Or if that's her own interpretation, the same way other fans have speculated. But she also interpreted the angel as kind of a symbol for Laura that it's going to be okay. Kind of a comfort in that moment. Um, so reading the ending is kind of Laura seeing a sense of comfort and, and hope that the angel had kind of found her. I mean, whether you interpret that angel as literal or more like a death dream, I'm saying probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, <laughs> dreams have a special place in Twin Peaks where I think it could be real and a dream at the same time. It can be real and a dream. It could be just the general comforts. I mean, remember, the Black Lodge is filled with things that one might find comfortable and familiar, where you find yourself, or the Red Room, however you want to interpret it, mm -hmm. with uh, the overall seating, familiar faces, uh, the contents of what you would enjoy, such as what seems to be coffee. So to find yourself an angel floating just beyond reach mm -hmm. uh, could be just more so internally revealing for Laura rather than, say, for example, a greater sign. It's just more so something that will give her comfort in yeah. this moment. I was also given comfort to see actors giving interviews I normally don't see for a lot of the Fire Walk With Me content. The actors for Teresa Banks, Buck, and Sheriff Cable make appearances. I thought that was neat. You thought it was neat that we got to bring those people in? Yeah. Yeah, the, the Buck actor had a lot to say. I didn't write any of it down, but he had a lot to say. <laughs> Look, again, I have a lot of things to say, but a lot of it was something that more so confirmed the overall yeah. environment itself. And and again, I recommend you check these interviews out if you have the Z-Day collection or if I have access to these interviews. Yeah, no, they're good stuff. I think it's very valid with these um, because I find them to be more documentary in style from what I've pro yeah. processed here. Because all a lot of these are just missing is just a narrator speaking in the background. And thusly, we moved to this place. I got a sandwich at this location while taking a break before we journeyed over here. But for the most part, it's a lost trail of thought that a lot of people have as they continue to just speak about these moments and I find those very fulfilling and valid for my own purposes you know of you, you mentioned this idea of a lost trail and whatever I have to take a moment here and complain about something I, I briefly alluded to it at the start there is one special feature on here one documentary that I, I, I am protesting against I am actively boycotting this uh -huh, one uh -huh, uh -huh. so on disc 10 there's one called reflections on the phenomena of Twin Peaks it covers Cast and crew interviews from like May, August, two thousand, like that that time span. Yes. So to put it to put it neutrally here, okay, the editing features multiple interviews spliced over each other in such a way that it would cut to a different actor out of context reacting or adding a new comment that seemingly is connected to what the previous person had said, but it also is is actually not. So like you might have the log lady making a comment about the stage or something, and then it'll cut to Cooper, like, smiling and laughing abruptly. Or just smiling. Which makes it seem like he's smiling at what she's saying, but it is completely out of context, taken out of context. There's a lot of odd, out of context things. It makes it, I feel like it's trying to invoke some sort of a mood throughout it. Oh, for sure. It, it's, it's very it's, stylistic. It's very stylistic. Um, a big flaw, I would say, that comes out of it is that it gives all the credits at the beginning on a black, like, yes. page with, like, white text. And as someone who has a hard time connecting faces and names. It does not tell you. Who, it's just like, he, these people are going to be here. Hey, time to go. Google. <laughs> so it, it just the content in it though, I still think is nice enough. And I think that I get a general idea of what they're trying to go for as in like themes that are happening inside the Twin Peaks. To end. me, it's one of those cases where the the stylistic impulse obfuscated the content mm -hmm. where I would much rather just be able to listen to the actors. Like I'm here to learn more about what their opinions are and their thoughts. I wouldn't say it feels a bit hyperbolic to say it's disrespectful to them, but I do feel like it rubs me the wrong way to take these interviews out of context and splice them together. Like they're talking to each other. 
I, that just sounds silly. Like, I just want to hear what they have to say. I, I don't want your weird editing. I will argue against, like, talking to each other and just more so talks to an individual beyond but they the like, camera. But they, like, yeah, they, like, but string is, them along like they're connected they when they're not. They string it along. There are points of connection. There are some. There, there are some. For example, when it comes to, like, the working conditions when it comes to Twin Peaks, it's this fun sort of, like, smoothie. Not fun as in, like, oh, yay, joy. But more so... It's something in which you can prepare yourself throughout the day and go into work for Twin Peaks just for David Lynch to go like, eh, I'm not feeling this. Mm -hmm. Let's do something different. Uh, it could be something in which you are focusing on something and getting ready, and then you walk in and it is so much heavier than it's expected. Yeah. Uh, it could be a situation where you look at something, and if you wanted to add a comma, it was a huge deal. So this sort of like weird mix and flow on like what you could and could not do, uh, I think is successful inside the point of reflection, but still is a rare instance I just, I just wanted the, I liked the content of what they were saying, but the execution of the editing, it made it like so uninteresting to watch for me. <laughs> like I was just at the end, not taking notes. I was just like, I'm not going to, maybe not in the, I'm not going to play with this game here. Maybe not in the respects of uninteresting, but it could be um, noted as like towards the end, they focused on something such as the red light inside of the room and uh, fire walk with me. And they had to like get the right amount of like blue uh, yeah. light strobing into a point that's almost very white just to make sure that's not irritating to watch. It seems like this whole thing was just in red light for you in a metaphorical and, sense. And there's even moments where like he'll distort like the sounds or the sights, like drawing out like a, I can't remember what the exact moment was. There's a point where Cheryl Lee ends up uh, making a sound and she closes her eyes and looks up and it's stretched it, 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 it looks just like, feels like someone experimenting and playing around with like Windows Movie Maker and having a good time back in the mid 2000s. Which I encourage that. It's just yeah, that I encourage it's that as a hobby, <laughs> not as I, a way of distributing this information. I encourage it in order to get a better understanding of work, what works, what doesn't, uh, and just yeah. having fun with things. I will always encourage the fun things. Like for example, I encourage the fact that the man from another place is actor. Michael J. Anderson. Michael J. Anderson uh, actually um, was intended to speak backwards. David Lynch didn't realize that uh, he spoke backwards, mm -hmm. but he did it as a kid, like middle school and so on. Yeah. Uh, and so he could actually come into the role and become the coach for people mm -hmm. to speak backwards, which is delightful because we have that other special feature from part one where he's actively coaching us yes. onto that yes. work. I was a horrible student, but it's still, uh, at the very least, I got a C grade, I think. It is also very um, strange, again, coincidence, fate and coincidence, figure large in our lives kind of moment where he has this actor to play the man from the place and then, like happens to have found someone who knows how to talk backwards <laughs> like that? Like, he what was, are the odds? He was there during his middle school days. That's very strange. Which, by the way, as a middle schooler, do you record yourself, or is there, like, some hyper-intelligent middle schoolers that were beyond my level in which could, like, decode and reverse the speech in their head when they said something backwards? Maybe that's how they just talk with their family at home. It's got used to it. You know, they some, said secret codes when like you're some middle families, school. No, no, that's disputed. Some families are bilingual, you know. Some just talk backwards <laughs> half the time. You know, it's, it's different, <laughs> different lives. You know, you don't, you don't judge them. I'm not judging them for that. I'm just very curious on why you're expanding this to like familial households now, in which now that frightens me on how people can continually do that casually over dinner. They're ha you know with how they're big too the powerful with how big the human population is and how long humans have been around. It's the first zero percent to ever exist. No, I agree. It has to have happened at least once. <laughs> there has to have been at least one family, <laughs> one family in this world that has talked backwards continuously with each other. <laughs> hey, listener. If you happen to belong to that family or you know someone who does, please uh, email us at snakeeyedreams1. That's not our email. Please email us at snakeeyedreams at gmail.com or tweet at us at snakeeyedreams1. The numeral one is in one family among you has definitely done this. <laughs> one also <laughs> is the number of the first season. Season one. <laughs> End of season one. God, it's a transition. <laughs> Season one. It's a transition the same way we could call a bird flying if, like, the bird threw itself off of a building. <laughs> exactly. It just the it, lack of opening the wings is calling into question. Frost says that the Twin Peaks pilot got viewing numbers that the Super Bowl would be lucky to get today. And today, meaning in the mid-2000s. Yeah. And he knew right away they were in business once that started kicking. 
And uh, season one, you know, we were not around for the Twin Peaks hype at its at its fullest or when it was airing. I wasn't even born. I can only about, neither was I, I can only about imagine, you know, how it must have been. Uh, we get accounts here, like Catherine Coulson talking about her daughter, who was saying, like, look, there's a bird who looks like you. And it was from the Twin Beaks episode of, or skit on Sesame Street. That's the, that's the second time I've heard that pun, because we also have something from Kipo, uh, which is on Netflix, mm. uh, which uses that as a title for an episode. Believe it or not. So it's this, this, this not been a singular instance. But yes, still, someone who, uh, as their kid watches um, something uh, that is aimed for her as the audience, says, there's someone who looks like you or sounds like you. It was something of you. And then you go in and to see this Muppet with like two little beaks carrying on a vlog that talks. It's That feels like a surreal moment to like walk in on. Mm -hmm. Also, Time Magazine had a cover with uh, with David Lynch on there. Uh, underneath the the other headlines of Khrushchev's secret tapes and SNL honchos feel the heat, uh, David Lynch has this photo, and then below it says, the wild at art genius behind Twin Peaks. You did it, folks. You did good, it. It was a good pun. Proud of you. The wild at art. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just kind of everywhere. They were getting interviews all over the place, you know, those who were willing to accept them and available to take them. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, believe it or not, um, I was actually the person of the year for 2006 for Time Magazine. Really? Yeah, 2006. It was me. So, if they Google this, if they Google it, 2006, they will find the unplugged professor. First of the year, they will find, they will find me as the person of the year. Excellent. Well, congratulations. Thank I, you. I didn't realize. Uh, I didn't realize I was in the presence of such an important person. Of course, you should have known all along. I I thought you were relatively. Uh, I worked unimportant. really hard for that achievement. I was 12 at the time. Really? Yes. 12 that's years old. That's revealing your age on year. podcast. Yes. Wow, that's a lot of information. They're I probably got the you. math wrong. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah. So, hard segue here. <laughs> Laura Palmer. People were freaking out so much about Twin Peaks. They were having fake funerals for Laura Palmer. I don't know how hmm. many or how often, but that is, that's crazy. That's, that's weird like, stuff, man. Like fake funerals, not just for Laura Palmer, but people would wrap themselves in plastic. So it's yeah. not just like Laura Palmer's picture would be there. But no, you purposely go to these parties for people to be wrapped in plastic. Maybe you to be wrapped in plastic. Maybe yeah. enjoy some coffee and pies off in the distance. And kind of like riding off of this success. Read Peter Pan. Twin Peaks. <laughs> uh, reading, riding off that success. Twin Peaks uh, was desperately trying to continue itself, right? So with the season one finale... Frost admits that he purposefully made as many cliffhangers as possible at the end of season one to get the ABC executives to buy into giving them a second season. Yep. A lot of stuff was going on all at the same time. And, and they kind of even shows them in the documentary. Like, yeah, there's just a ton of things. But there's a big difference between that and season two's ending, right? Uh, but like, season two also say? has a bunch of cliffhangers. There's all sorts of cliffhangers never answered. Never answered. Never answered. We don't know what's going to happen to Cooper. It's like his body is all sorts of in a weird situation. Right? Uh, we had the bank blow up and we had three elderly people as well as Audrey Horn in the middle of the explosion. Did any of them survive an explosion Leo at Johnson. Point Blank Range? Is he going to get arachnophobia? Is he, go is he just going to be freaks? afraid of spiders or is he going to be there forever chewing on a rope? Is it going to be a situation where... Catherine Martell gets just a bunch of money because she won. Will John is, Justice Wheeler ever come back? Is that, did, a, is that a plot? Is that a, is that a cliffhanger? Did little Nikki grow up? <laughs> 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 Point is, yes, there were, there were, oh, Ben Horn, obviously, at the fireplace. Oh, yeah, Ben Horn, yeah, fireplace, yeah, 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 bludgeoning yeah, in the yeah, hand. Yeah, little thing like that. But little Nikki. Little Nikki, though. <laughs> anyway, things are wild here, right? But I think, I think we're on the same page, Professor, that, like, the tone difference right in season two's finale this is twin peaks blowing itself up this is david lynch julius caesaring his own show mm -hmm. by that i mean brutus julius Caesar. He's stabbing it a bunch of times <laughs> is what i'm saying is that it, it 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 feels so antagonistic that like if twin peaks season three had happened in the 90s like let's say abc was like we have to continue this after season two was ending if they did that, I feel like the tone going in, if they went back to like the sort of quirky, funny Twin Peaks, it'd be really weird whiplash because they had set up this incredibly like dark and just 
behemoth of an ending that just hated everything and fought against everything. It either reset, broke things apart, reset being like, say, for yeah. example, uh, issues between Ed as well as Norma. That was one thing that we didn't bring up as well as like what happens with Nadine. Um, but yeah, things either reset, things either break, or things are in a complicated situation that we don't even know what to do with. You throw Twin Peaks in a blender and I love it. Also, uh, while we were think thinking about this and talking about this, it, it crossed my mind, and I don't really know what to do with it yet, but Chew it. the similarity in the finale of Benjamin Horn getting a forehead bloody injury at a fireplace in the same episode that Dale Cooper has a forehead bloody injury with a mirror with Bob. Yeah. Fireplace. Mm -hmm. Bob. Ben's trying to do all this goodness, but is constantly in doubt with his inner demons. Uh, I see Dale Cooper's always trying to do goodness, but is constantly in battle with his inner demons. I see where you're going with this. So like how uh, Leland had Bob, it is just more so Cooper ended up having <laughs> Benjamin Horn. They were the same person yeah, the whole that's, time. Yeah, that's what I was trying that's to get exactly at. exactly what you were going for. Sans is Ness. Sans <laughs> is Ness. Oh. <laughs> Man. Um, so season one, pretty much universally acclaimed. Everybody loves season one. Season two rolls around and like people are supposed, according to some of the, some of the feelings in the documentaries, sometimes people are a little bit disappointed that they didn't get a killer reveal right away. But generally season two starts off successfully. They get to a point where, you know, the killer has to be revealed. And this is that, this is that moment, right? This schism that infamously Twin Peaks is known for. It's kind of commonly accepted that the second half of season two, after Laura Palmer's killer's revealed, it goes down the drain. People like the last episode. People will usually defend the last episode, but it's that stretch that even Twin Peaks fans don't oftentimes like. That I've seen people say like, can I skip these episodes? They'll ask on Reddit or ask on like Facebook group. Can I just skip from Laura's killer to the end. I know I'm out of the usual camping side of this, but never ask me this question. I tell people no. Even with filler arcs, when it comes to things, I find importance in order to check out these things. But I understand time on this planet is limited. So when it comes Just, to the... That's my answer, listeners. If you ever ask the Unplugged Fest, don't skip it. Look at it. Live in it. Bathe in it. It's yours. How many episodes of One Piece did you get through? And listeners, if you don't know, One Piece is a very, very long anime series, also based on a manga that's been running for like decades. I got uh, about the 890 episode. And area. did you skip any of the filler? No. Okay. No. So, professor is someone there's some who. There's good filler inside there. There's horrible filler, but there's some good filler. My in point there. is, Professor means what he says. I mean what I say. He is. He's watched 890 episodes of the show, never skipping one episode. So. Returning to what we're saying, though, when, when the documentary rolled around to season two, when it had to talk about season two, it opened with the most ominous tone possible. Like they they dug out the most black lodgiest music they could find in Angela Bottolamenti's like pockets. They Khalil dug through raking, the lint. They, they the raked air. through the lint in Andrew, Angela Bottolamenti's pockets. And it's all like doom and gloom to the point where as they're talking like cast members and crew members about how bad season two was, <laughs> they literally insert a clip of Harry Truman, Michael on Kean's character saying, I know you want to hope for the best, but you ought to prepare for the worst. And then it has that part with Pete taking a deep breath and going, Oh dear. And it's just like, that is in the midst of everyone talking about how bad season it, two it is. That's a mood. So much. There is not a single person who defends season two in this documentary. Which we don't know if anyone said anything and just got cut or if no one had anything positive to say because there were some people who were pretty neutral. I don't think Mark Frost said anything really that bad about it. There were a few people who were more neutral who had just said like, yeah, I liked the blend of the show in the first season more because I liked the, the sense of balance it had with the humor and the mystery of not knowing the killer. That's a fair stance. Anyone who likes season one more, valid. Totally fine. Mm -hmm. No problem with that. Want to be crystal clear on that from the get-go. The problem is, though, is that it just shoves in your face this idea that season two is like this awful blight on Twin Peaks. Now, for the points that they do bring up, I will preface this first 10. It's not something that I personally feel, but I can see where other people would feel this because 
at the end of the day, this is my subjective yes. adoration for Twin Peaks. You can on what like I enjoy or that. dislike anything. You could hate the whole entire series while you're listening to this podcast. Because, <laughs> because there are some shifts that do happen inside of Twin Peaks yes. uh, that are apparent and maybe lost an audience for that. What seems to be a very common take onto it is that introducing the starred cast and just introducing more and more people uh, to Twin Peaks mm -hmm. um, ended up sort of like taking more and more away from the core cast as some would end up explaining and um, it made things a little bit more confusing especially for the actors that were present there um, I think that a good example with this being like all these cast members that are coming in um, they've been described as star cast members like people who are known and have a name for themselves coming in to play a role into like Twin John Peaks. Renault's actor but the biggest takeaway from that is say for example this person is a starred actor he's starring in this role or mm -hmm. she's starring in this the, role the fe the, the featured the, actors they're being featured they're being brought in but they might have to leave for some sort right. of thing so making sure they don't live in Twin Peaks and bringing them in from outside it makes sense structurally but i can see where people are feeling that things are getting more away from twin peaks for season one uh we did get interest uh towards like what's happening on josie's end. we get like hints of things in the background but for the most part even when very we, insular when we uh exited off to canada and so on it still was a place that was owned and ran from benjamin horn as well as his brother mm -hmm. it was still like the people involved were also living in twin peaks more such as john renault peaks itself uh, as a town so physically being there and making that evil being there i understand that i'm compelled by that i like the expansion and exploration of making sure twin peaks feels like a place uh that exists amongst the other rest of the bits of the world instead of just its own location yeah. so i like when these things get tethered I just understand where people are coming from when the they don't. The thing with season two is it didn't really do much against that. Like, the only arc that was literally outside of Twin Peaks was the Evelyn and James arc, which you like more than I do. I don't hate it. I, I do think it, it has some bad moments in there, but I, I overall think it's just a weaker arc. Like, if I look at all of Twin Peaks and if I were to rank all of the character arcs and all of, like, the, 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 the different situations, yeah, I would put James and Evelyn toward the very bottom for me, but that's the only one that's outside of Twin Peaks. But that's the, like the physicality right. of it. I can still see like emotionally, like when you have these outsiders come in. We already had an outsider. His name was Dale Cooper. Right. And then we also had Albert of, Rosenfeld. We also had Gordon Cole, which are part of the FBI, but bringing all sorts of other outsiders from different perspectives. We also I can had see where Lucy's. It feels we, had, we had Lucy's sister. That was in season two, wasn't it? I don't even know. <laughs> it's hard to keep track, and I think we that had, was a um, problem. We had our Thunder God, the the Judge guy. Yeah. But which the point is there, there there were a there few were, they just didn't stick they didn't stick they also didn't feel like they had to like be anywhere else I, I guess I don't really agree in the sense that what what are these foreign elements so Jean Renault was was French Canadian he is about as foreign as Bernard Renault from the first from the pilot he's Bernard, he's, he's but, still a Renault member but Renault members still lived in Twin Peaks they were actively in Twin Peaks there was a reason for them I mean to be Bernard in Twin smuggled back and forth but yeah I Bernard mean, smuggled back and forth but still he was like the janitor around okay. the area I could say that he probably slept Otherwise, probably upstairs when it came to something like John Renault he seemed like a well-traveled man he had his overall thick accent and he yeah. had never really had to step into twin peaks because he was off inside of what's happened at the uh the one-eyed jacks blackie being present in, inside of it was more so of a background element that they began to introduce more and more and bringing her to the forefront and then it became more of a focus on one-eyed jacks as a location but again one-eyed jacks is still not in twin peaks like, that's power. the thing like we can accept it we can i say accept it with an ex just to clarify we can <laughs> we can accept it or we can accept it with an ACC. <laughs> and I accept it. But 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 it is still outside of Twin Peaks. So even in season one, mm -hmm. it did leave Twin Peaks for the one eyed Jacks content. It did. So that's that's what I'm saying is like this isn't black and white. This isn't like see season one was all in Twin Peaks and then season two got away from it. It's like, no, not really. And even the parts where it did go away from it were not really that different. Mm -hmm. Um Anyway. I also have to ask when it comes to like introducing these cast members, we do know that there was more of a lean, uh, it seems, from the company to be like, hey, you should really introduce this killer. There was seemed to be pressure as right. opposed towards like the season one where it seemed like there was less pressure. Uh, so when it came to the season two, what about for these new cast members? It seems, I don't know how much David Lynch or any of the other directors had these personal conversations with right. these people and how that personal relationship, that may have caused a dissonance also with other people. How can they recognize these people when they're working on their own schedules popping by? 
But yeah, Kimmy Robinson, the actor who plays Lucy, uh, literally said that the whole second season sucked because she didn't know who anyone was. Mm -hmm. Which I... At a certain point, I say that that's an exaggeration, like pretty, pretty big exaggeration. Her character was around Dick Tremaine, one of the newer characters. Yeah. But otherwise, like, yes, there were some new cast members, but a lot of them had been foreshadowed well before their appearance. I give enough benefit of the doubt that to say that when you're acting in an experience and then view your own acting in that experience, maybe there's like a different lens that someone ends oh, up Oh, absolutely. Seeing. She's viewing it from a totally different lens than we are. Yes. But I'm still, as, as a sort of like wholesale statement, if she mm. said like, if she said, you know, I could not connect to the show because I didn't know who anyone was anymore. Fine. Yeah, this, was not she, a, this did not have I statements. No, she said the whole second season sucked because of this. And that was in the Twin Peaks documentary. Yes. That's where I, that's where I'm just kind of like, okay, wait a second. So like you and I, Professor, are mm -hmm. second season defenders to yes. varying degrees. Hi. I will say my statement, you are free to add on it because I know you have more to say positive Please. than even I do. But I feel like a lot of the good things that we like about Twin Peaks come from season two. There's lore with like the Black Lodge. There's some great characters. I mean, even if not all of them are winners for everyone, I do think that Wyndham Earl was an interesting villain. I think oh, Jean yes. Renault was a very interesting villain. I adore both of them. I think you have a lot of fan favorite characters. People really do like Denise. People really do... Um, to varying degrees, like uh, Dick Tremaine. I'm a big fan of Dick Tremaine. There's there's a lot of fun, interesting characters that are introduced during that arc. I think that it's got some of the most like com some of the most compelling plot lines and side plots as uh, happen here. I think there's a lot of character growth happening for the characters that get the good growth. Audrey may get shafted, but her father had an excellent series of arcs. I'm just on the side where it's like there were some really good things. Like we wouldn't have the Black Lodge as we know it. Without season two, a lot of the funniest and most iconic lines and moments are from season two. The thing that opens up our podcast Hi. is in the Owl Cave in season two, a place most wonderful and strange. The biggest thing I got to say with this sort of mindset is I, I find it very humorous when we see multiple people when addressing something like Fire Walk With Me, which as time went on became more claimed. There's a lot of actors that are coming out uh, through interviews yeah. like this, they're saying that they just, like these critics at just the time they just didn't understand. Right. Like th they may be, they may be intelligent people, but just something wasn't clicking with them, uh, or like some people maybe digged a little bit it's, deeper into it, the insult. It almost feels like we're almost in a, a realm of our own. I'm not like bashing anyone for that. If right. no one's enjoying season two, okay. I just don't want to take it but for I, granted. But I still exactly. I yeah. don't want it to be automatically just assumed. That everyone feels that way. I think that people should experience it for themselves and check yes. it out and then come to their own conclusions, such as I would say about Fire Walk With Me, likely around its day and age when people booed it on the screen. And that's the thing, like season two largely was a backlash because it got too silly for people. And then Fire Walk With Me got too dark. Season one was that balance for a lot of people, I think. And I can understand liking that balance. I agree. The thing is, though is that it's just as valid to like Twin Peaks at its darkest as it is to like Twin Peaks at its silliest. Um, and I and I will weigh things I like more and dislike more, and that's, to me, part of enjoying art is talking about those things openly and, and agreeing and disagreeing with each other. Yes. Again, I just don't like it when we're being told that, like, clearly it's a failure. Clearly season two was bad. When David Lynch practically disowns the entire season. And it's just like it just feels a little sad because there's so many good things that came out of it that you, you wouldn't have otherwise. Like you would not have fire walk with me. If you did not have the killer being revealed and season two's ending, you would not have the black lodge. You would not have a lot of the most compelling elements of Cooper's character. It's very bold. Nonetheless, that they're like incorporating so much negativity into season two mm -hmm. into their special features, literally deep into like watching Twin Peaks. And there's just nothing really satisfying any other narrative. And again, no one is praising it. There's not like a contrary view in there. It's just so it's almost the official position, <laughs> right? Like it's 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 just wild to me. And again, it's so I can understand if anyone listening is just like season two is boring or uninteresting because they don't care about the side characters. They your, don't, you know, that's fine. Your position is valid. Absolutely. It's just that for me and Khalil, it's something in which it's kind of sad to see this old yellow dog being taken out back when 
I've never seen Old Yeller myself, so I don't okay. know if like the dog was okay. But I personally think this dog is something I thoroughly enjoy. Now, I'm going to yell about more things. Thank you. So. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours. Thanks. So Mark Frost said that if they had gotten a season three yeah. back in the 90s, right? They would have set Cooper up to be both the hero and the villain. And that he and Lynch would have had renewed dedication to the series. They would have came back, both of them really at the helm of it again, right? They wouldn't leave it again. Frost said he had mapped out ideas that would have brought the show back to why he said the fans loved the show, an examination of good and evil in people's hearts, that you don't have to go to a big city to see sort of the good and evil of the world, that you can see that in the small town. And here's the thing. Here's the thing without getting, cause you don't know what happens in the eventual season three, quote unquote, the return. Yeah. You know, I call it a sequel series. Some called season three, whatever. I won't say if the return does these things or doesn't do these things. What I will say is that the wording here, that it's going to bring it back to why fans loved it. And he interpret that to be the examination of good and evil. I am over here just scratching my head because that would imply that season two had gone away from that, right? We're going to bring it back to that. You're telling me, just to clarify, that there is no good and evil being examined. In, no, we're not saying no, I shouldn't be hyperbolic. Yeah. You're saying me that it's less good and evil being examined in a season that has Wyndham Earl, Jean Reno, including that comment about Jean Reno to Cooper about how he brought the darkness by coming in and complicating things. John Justice Wheeler, everything with Benjamin Horn, Major Briggs and his spiritual quests, Josie. All of the Josie stuff, even Truman with his, like, turning to alcohol after the grieving process. Much as we might malign it, some of us, Evelyn's arc has a lot of the good and evil being explored. And the entirety of the white and black lodge content of season two. You are telling me that the reason season two didn't do as well is because it didn't have the theme of good and evil being examined as much. I would argue. What? I, I, I'm here to argue on the defense of this. I still disagree with, like, the stance on this placement of phrase you're giving mark frost here like he's this giving idea himself i'm just quoting he's the man himself. i think it's poorly worded i don't think that there's enough emphasis on what i think matters in the statement and that is the small town aspect it's trying to if we are to go alongside with a lot of the arguments and a lot of things that are repeated through this it's trying to keep it to the core cast and just try to keep it in the small town of Twin Peaks because when you start expanding outside from it, it becomes more reliant on the relationships externally. Say, for example, for your potential um, individuals that are across the seas with fantastical mm -hmm. languages. When the good and evil in the small town, I imagine, is within your household, within the people close to you. So something you relatable. Think, you think the thing that Mark Frost was prioritizing here most was the sense of it being located in very much one small town. One small town and personal, because for a lot of these examples, otherwise, it seems to be more played up in uh, a very soap opera-esque way. These things mm. in which, like, evil... Okay. Th there's no real connection for, say, for example, someone to relate to. <sighs> That's what I'm thinking is intended with the phrasing, but does not hit its mark. There is so much I wish I could say. And listeners, <laughs> listeners who have watched The Return. I keep doing this. I will not, I cannot <laughs> say more, but I want listeners to know right now <laughs> that I'm thinking about The Return and how it handles these things we're talking about. Remember, I will this not say is, more. This seems to be primarily a Lynch work, and this is Mark Frost speaking in yeah. terms of what he prepared. I and, don't know how much. Okay, the, well then, then, the I'll, then I'll do you one better. Then I'll cool. do you one better, listeners. Hi, I'm thinking about how Mark Frost's <laughs> book, The Secret History of Twin Peaks, handles <laughs> some of these things we're talking about. Excellent. And I, uh, I'm percolating some thoughts on that. <laughs> we have we've been going a while here. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this conversation so far, Professor. Um, the light just turned on in the kitchen, didn't it? Hmm? Did that light just turn on in the oh, kitchen? Oh, no, I forgot about it. Oh, God. It just, like, brightened all of a sudden. <laughs> Jump scared me. <laughs> it's Mark Frost speaking from beyond the life, because he's still alive. So, beyond in the life, reaching out to you. Touching you. <laughs> touching you. You know a song. Angelo, bottle of menti. Bow, 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 bow. Bow. Wind through the trees. 
There's nothing <laughs> matching now. <laughs> just the like Twin Peaks. The structure got punched. Just like Twin Peaks. So there's a section, there's a, there's, a, there's a documentary section called Postcards from the Cast. And I just want to first and foremost say, this is not a documentary. These are just interviews, Professor. But I'm glad you saved them because we had a lot of content in the interview episode. It was fine to save them. Yeah. We also have a lot of content in this episode. So actually, I don't know if it's any better, but... There's a lot of content in either episode. I put them here because, again, I follow on the realm of... There is someone in the background... Asking questions, but not in an interview way. More so like okay. poking the question along, almost prodding the sheep past the pen and into the lands beyond and just letting the sheep go. Uh, but Yeah, <laughs> that's how it is. It seems like that is the case. Not only that, but also a form of interview I find um, to be very directed. Uh, this doesn't seem directed. It seems like we are getting like a snapshot into people's lives. Postcards is the best example for it. And that's what it's called inside yeah. of this. Because it feels like someone sent you either a postcard saying, yeah, yeah, you know what? Everything's going fine for my work. I'm having a great time. Uh, or someone's just like, I went off into the jungle and I had drugs. They're all very, very <laughs> different from each other. They to are. the extent that I don't know what they were asking them to get these responses. I don't know if they were asking anything. I think that was conversation. <laughs> they just shoved a microphone in their face no, with no, a no. camera. They're, they're in scenarios yeah. where they're sitting. Like, for example, we've seen the physical yes. interviews happening with, yes. say, for example, uh, Benjamin Horn's actor as well as Man from Another Place's actor. They're in the same place. I don't think they live together. I could be wrong. They could live together. I don't think they live together. It'd be very together. funny if they do. <laughs> I think that these were just like dialogues that they just yeah. included because these are very interesting people. They have yes. interesting lives and interesting takes. So in not really a particular order here, uh, Wendy Robbie, the actor for Nadine, um, she talked about her background being more as a stage actor than yes. as a screen actor. And uh, she came to the audition in a, shawl. in a shawl because she thought Northwest Passage is about Lewis and Clark. Yeah. Fair assumption. It's a fair assumption. So she just wears a shawl there. And she remembers David Lynch remarking when, when he, she was auditioning, when she was kind of coming in for the role, um, that she was a very jolly person. And he asked, you know, do you really feel like you could play Nadine, who's very angry? Mm -hmm. Obviously, yes was the answer. And, and, uh, no, it wasn't like her who gave yes as the answer. It was the recruiter that gave the answer ah. that was inside the background. It's was like, oh, yeah, no, she can do it. Yes. <laughs> She's got this. And then she wrestled David Lynch into submission. That didn't happen well, uh, as far as what's been verbally said. But uh, I saw it in, in Wendy Robbie's eyes. <laughs> you know, I, I could see the memory. Grace Zabisky, the actor for Sarah Palmer, talks about how when this pilot was being screened, when she was in this pilot screening, she heard people laughing when Sarah Palmer was screaming at the telephone call. Yes, and uh, during this point, it's like there's even people who would scold those people who were laughing. Yeah, like Meanwhile, they just don't get it. She, it's not funny. She herself is just looking at the situation. It's like... Okay. Um, and to the point where people would even ask her, like, like interview, in interviews, like, stick like, a little microphone you know, inside your face. You know, were you playing it for laughs? Were you trying to make it funny? Uh, oh, oh, it's even realized. It's like, wait, do you realize, like, what those people were doing? Yeah. It's like, yeah. No, they were laughing. I see. Oh, so you played it for laughs. And just, like, being yeah. able to just, like, take that sort of, like, dive into it. Yeah. She's just like, I, like, I can see the humor in it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Miguel Ferreira. Uh, Albert Rosenfeld's actor, he talked about being really confused about the script until he saw the pilot itself. Oh, like yes. Just Mark Frost itself. was just like, you look confused? Uh, here you go. And just gives him a tape. And yeah. uh, Albert Rosenfeld is just like, uh, okay. And it's just like, it, it's going to make sense. Don't worry about it. Just go home for the weekend. It's like, fine. Uh, okay, I'll do that. He pops in the tape. He watches it. Beep, 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 beep. Guys, guys being his friends, you got to get over here. Yeah, I got to show he, you the best thing ever. Because and was, it sounds like this, and he does that back to the future thing where he puts the phone to it. No, he didn't actually do that, but I imagine that's like the Yeah, scenario. he like yelled, come over to my house right now. And then they saw it a second time, and they saw it a third yeah. time, which is just a wild experience. Just imagine, like, there's something that you are just so, like, interested in uh -huh. heavily that you invite all your friends over, and you just keep watching something. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so he'd been handed the script for his episode, which took place after the pilot, not having seen the pilot. Yes. Which I could see causing some confusion. Yes. Now, that's what we're going to do for the sequel podcast, right? We're going to take them, but we're not going to show them the intro to Twin Peaks. We're going to just jump them into episode two. What also caused confusion <laughs> was when Machen Amick, the actor for Shelley Johnson, would forget to take off her makeup for her bruises and her injuries. And people were just like, oh, poor girl, and just like, there's concern. People give her hotline numbers being like, here, uh, if, if you need help, here's the number. It's like, thanks. I'll just and, put and it And part of that was because she'd forget to take the makeup off. And part of it was also this thing that other um, 
interviewees had mentioned here that there were instances where they would just get the character and the actor mixed. Like they would blend them together. Yes. So some people would like be talking to her and be like, what are you doing over here? Twin Peaks is in three hours. You're at our store right <laughs> like, now. A How are you going to get it there in time? There's a dissonance uh, that can go through either. Like she assumes that they said live um, for like, for a while, for myself, yeah. whenever I thought TV, I thought people would be on such a strict schedule that would be done maybe a few weeks. It's in a very different age, different age at that time. I feel like yeah. that'd be hard to. Ha- I mean, I feel like it's different now with the way information's processed. Yeah. But um, that is that is wild to think that that people would kind of have that response or like yeah, t- actually kind of mistake the character and the actor. Uh, Michael Anderson, the man from their place, he would get people freaking out, like in New York when they saw him. <laughs> just like they would react, and instead of like calming down inside of the overall presence, it just it went the opposite direction, where he's just like, "Oh no, 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 no!" So just imagine like walking from your day to day, just to have people continuously like rise in panic around you. Yeah, it feels like power. I want that power. I don't know power. if it's a good power. That's a it's, bad power. It's a bad power for most people. I want that power. Yeah, I gotta I gotta recommend you read Frankenstein sometimes, so you know the power of that. <laughs> You know who has all the power? Me. Russ Tamblin, the actor for Dr. Jacoby. Okay. His daughter. His daughter. Oh, this was because the sweetest story. when she was eight years old, they were doing a signing for Twin Peaks cast members. Was almost crazy. everyone was there. Yeah, almost everyone was there. It was at Sunset Boulevard. Yes. Which you can't get anymore, like... I mean, I guess they could have could have been at Sunset Boulevard wearing Wizard of Oz cosplay. Then yes. they could have been maybe more David Lynch at that point. <laughs> One of them is dressed as Elvis amidst the uh, Wizard of Oz. <laughs> but, uh... The eight-year-old daughter of Russ Tamlin had all the cast members like sign her shoes. It, it, it's adorable being just like apparently sticking your foot in people's faces and being like, "Will you sign my shoes?" And mm-hmm. that just imagine that. Like how can, how can anyone say no? And I also love the fact that the actor for Bob yeah, just signed just Frank Bob. Silva. Just put Fra- Bob. Frank Bob. Bob, which is good. Which is good. <laughs> Catherine Coulson, the log lady. Uh, I didn't really. I, I listened and I took notes. I guess I have less to say on it. But there was this photo that her nephew took where there was this child in Africa who didn't have enough clothes, and they gave the child this faded, like, white dress with the log lady on it. It was a shirt that was made into a little dress for her to wear, and it was yeah. her first dress, and she holds on to, like, this picture of this uh, girl that overall was helped the, by the thanks of her nephew, that also, like, she can see, like, her face, and that, that sort of, like, fun impact, uh, and she holds very dearly to mm-hmm. that. And it, it's very sweet. It, it's actually where we close out uh, oh, these yeah, postcards. It is. it is. So having that on an ending note, um, just like how dear she holds this is, it, it's sweet. It's very sweet. Also with Africa, Cheryl Lee, Laura Palmer herself. Mm-hmm. After everything with Twin Peaks, and I presume Fire Walk With Me is part of that. I assume. Uh, considering she, the toll it had. She had to take a vacation. She had to take a vacation, even against like people that thought she was crazy like for her choice destination uh she needed something for herself and for a month she actually went over to kenya and tanzania in tanzania and she kind of talks about it as being this really life-changing experience um kind of being in the moment and how time would change um looking at wildlife um kind of being in the in the area talked positively about the people of kenya and tanzania um Interesting. Also, she talked about the importance of educating children about animals. It was kind of a random tangent, it felt like, but she, she went on talking about she that. Works, uh, she had worked a lot inside of her own means of activism and so on, um, as such as areas uh, such as PETA and yeah. so on. So she's had experience enough uh, and individuals she's been around enough uh, to accrue certain beliefs on what would be best. And there there are points in which, say for example, I do I agree to certain degrees, I disagree to certain degrees, but so far she has a passion for her overall craft. Mm-hmm. And wherever you disagree, you will fight her. You will fight her <laughs> to cage the animal. No, I'm not going to fight Laura Palmer. Um, I think that there are certain uh, programs out there. I think that there are certain areas to assist the areas of wildlife. I know that PETA in the past has come under scrutiny as well Mm. uh, for some of their overall methods, if you will. Uh, And as someone who's also worked uh, alongside um, important programs that also do occur in certain zoos as well. I'm not saying that all zoos are like this, and I'm not saying all places are like this. Everyone needs to take pieces of research and just try to look through multiple sources in order to help as many people as they can. And I feel that as far as Cheryl Lee is concerned, she's very passionate in wanting to try to work and help with these people. So overall in the methods that she can, I can only hope the best in, I believe that with, if her intentions are well Mm -hmm. enough and she's taking the proper channels with fantastic for her. 
I think we should immediately release every single animal in a cage into the town that they are currently having the zoo in. So, like, if there's a zoo... I include SeaWorld in this, by the way, too. You just break the aquariums and just let them run free I did not <laughs> over the streets. I did not realize, like, your activist inspiration was the Joker. <laughs> you free a dog. <laughs> Nobody bats an eye. Mm-hmm. You free one whale, and suddenly everyone goes out of their mind. <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, quick side note, not in this same uh, featurette about the postcards, but Cheryl Lee elsewhere, she does talk a lot about Jennifer Lynch and the secret diary of Laura Palmer. Yes. <laughs> mm. Yes. And um, talked about how like amazing Jennifer Lynch was for that and how she would constantly, Laura would, um, Cheryl Lee would constantly refer back to it portraying Laura for Fire Walk With Me. I just thought it was kind of neat to know like, yes, Cheryl Lee definitely read the secret diary as she was making fire walk with me. And it did inform her character. Huh. Neat. That was very neat. I enjoy that bit of tidbit. Yes. Richard Bamer. Maybe the tidbit I enjoyed the most. This is, this is Benjamin Horn. Yeah. If Laura yeah, starts off the thing, like they if start Cheryl off Lee on this note is to travel. Just, just go ahead and go. I deeper. feel like they started with Richard Bamers because it's the most wild, and they're like, we're going to hook him from the start. Yeah, it, it's also the biggest example of not everyone's uh, <laughs> situation postcard is going to be the same length. No, for and the sake of Richard Bamer, his was incredibly long for someone like I was like 15 as, minutes in, and the professor happened to be walking by, and I was like, because he's seen this before I did. Yes. And I was like, is this next like hour going to be just Richard Bamer? Because I said, on one hand, that's a long time. On the other hand, I kind of hope it is just one hour. It wasn't the full hour. It was not. It was like 15 minutes. But uh, yes. he starts out right away, just no preamble, just talking about going up the Amazon and meeting a shaman. And he brought his camera. And he said he was taking, really pictures, taking pictures of the monkeys and the stuff along the side. Yeah, sure. But he talks a lot about ayahuasca. Yes. And he would talk about it as a tool for the shaman as well as a psychedelic. And he did it there a few times. Said it was quite beautiful. And the camera, meanwhile, is like just zooming radically in on him, like zooming in on his hand and his eyes just way too close yeah. in, in a way that's like intense. And it doesn't do that for anyone else like that. Not that much. There's mm-hmm. some close face shots, but not like you're seeing the, the, the fine printing of his fingertips. Not until you get to the reflections from disc 10. Oh yeah, we don't we in. don't talk about that. Yeah, that's I the talk bad about part. It. And um he goes on about how like being there uh he had like this part where it was like his skin was like treated with this like ointment or whatever that turned his skin like blue and he was like seeing his reflection. He talked about how his hand looked like a monkey's hand and then at one point he like is talking kind of and and the the person interviewing or talking to him um was saying like um what it was like kind of asking what it was like and he said it was more like being at a temple. Um, and he said, you go there to find the God within. No, it's, it's a insight. That's very unique. I'm not saying unique in the most sense. Like, Oh yes, that's a unique experience. And just not, no, I f- firmly and just invested in this man's story. I would love to like pick at his brain and see what adventure he's gone on. Because apparently this whole experience itself is heavily unique that she at, through time, he was able to sort of adapt to the scenarios, similar to how Cheryl Lee says that, like, you just adapt to the mm-hmm. time. His environment, for the most part, you were just naked inside of the streams and so on, just bathing yourself and just naked throughout. Uh, you end up climbing a, up the trees and so on and just, like, moving across your environment. It's something that is so heavily... Not what I expected from this man on first glance that I, I want to know more. Well, and this is, this is not, I don't want to say this is why I said, I didn't even, I didn't know the story either, but I remember talking before about, yeah, if I could have more documentary interview content or like someone, you know, writing a memoir about Twin Peaks of their experiences, God dang, it'd be this guy. Like it's, it's some- I've mentioned before, like I'm really interested in what he contributes. I know that he took so many of the photographs that we have of the set, like yeah, his art form of photography is present yeah. uh, throughout the overall, and to the point that we have a Richard Bamer gallery. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm biased also because I like Ben a lot as a character, <laughs> but but Bamer just seems like a really interesting member of the cast. To just the more I see and hear about him, the more I'm like, huh, what an interesting guy, <laughs> you know? Kimmy Robertson with uh, Lucy Moran here. Uh, she has 
a story of her own. It's not nearly as as drug induced in the it, Amazon. Is it a story? It's a situation. It, it's a situation where we just find it literally the camera's focused almost like ninety percent on a hole inside of like nearby the house where the garden is, and about eight. To nine percent of it is checking out the cute animals nearby because they're talking about how the cat, uh, while also taking sh- the dog's adorable, the cat's adorable, they're adorable and just playing together. But um, they're just talking about how, like, yeah, no, there's a hole in my garden. Yes, and it's like I don't think it's a rat. It's may have been a rat. It's might not be a, a raccoon. Might, it could be a skunk. Yeah, it's probably that. It's just speculating about this thing in the hole, and that was it. So this is where. More confirmation on my end. <laughs> I did not count this amongst the interviews. Okay. This is a snippet of someone's life. It's like those filler bits of content when you just like are exploring different places, like in those, um, it's like checking out like a snippet of life where you see like someone who's experienced with cooking or just life, like an Anthony Bourdain situation of like documentary where you just see these snippets of life, if mm-hmm. you will. The only difference, again, is that we don't have a narrative to go on with this documentary. It's just snippets without construct, just called postcards. My second favorite of these is probably going to go to Don Davis, the Major Briggs actor. Oh, he God. had a really good one. It's very strong. Like this person, uh, like we're introduced, like already heavy bias on my end going in is that we start on his puppy. He's yes. got a big old Open puppy. up on a dog, and Don Davis emerges to give her a treat. Her full name is Todd Mountain Midnight Lady, but he's, he calls her his jewel. Yes. And, and she goes right up to the camera. Yes, and just as we're getting the sweet moment, she's like, oh, she's so nice. Like, yep, much nicer than me. It's like. It's got a good sense of humor. It's got a good and sense of humor. And he gives us a little tour of his home, his, his work stuff, his home gym. Finding out that overall he's someone who's just very, like, wants control but recognizes that it's not really possible but still wants his space to be comfortable. Like, at least, like, that scene. Yeah. That scenery helps. Um, he, he talks about at length about that feeling of having lust for what you do. Not just loving what you do, but having lust for what you it's do. It's something that's transformed into lust, um, at the very least for his work, because it's almost like you need it at this, like, And it points. can become an obsession. And and he talks very, like, candidly about, like, yeah, when he was at his most successful, he was at his most distracted and ended up, like, losing connections that were really important to him, like his marriage. He, around the time of the interview, wanted to try to turn some of that around because he wants to try to pursue some of those passions still with like his, his art. Because yeah. that's why he got into the business in this sake, to try to, at the very least, seek out more of his art. But And uh, we see this carving of a fish that he's done, and we see this carving of a Native American man as well. We see his drawing table that's located up. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, of his overall work and how he's drawn his whole life. You get you get a good, solid sort of like view and compass into this person's life. Uh, if, at yeah, the same I, time, I there's, still, there's still much more to explore, but amongst yeah. the other ones, like I couldn't tell you the lifestyles for most of it, everyone here, but he's just pretty open about his life. You get to see his overall living space, yeah. his mentality, and it doesn't seem like... At this point, he's very blunt to the nature that I don't know what. Yeah, he it doesn't feel put on at all. Um, and you know, I said it was my second favorite. It's it's really close for first in the sense that you have Benjamin Horn's drug trip through the Amazon. Yeah, is hard to beat. It is, but I I gotta give a lot to Don Davis here just for his candidness and um, you know, he kind of has the, these like quotes that he says where it just feels like you're you're hearing the words of wisdom just from his mouth. You could uh, again, I think that. <laughs> In the scenario of something such as a documentary, yeah. I think this would be very fitting, especially with this person who could potentially have like heavy regrets inside. There's, of his there's life. also this kind of back note of sadness because he passed away in 2008. Yes, which would be only a couple of years after this. Yes, because if this was made in 2006, mm-hmm. so you know, I'm hoping that those last two years he was able to kind of reclaim those aspects of his life and enjoy that. I think that we can only really hope the best for people in general that they don't have to feel like caught inside of that little muck in of a swamp at times it, it it felt to me just on impulse that that he had made some progress away from that by the time this video is recording but yeah uh, don't know al strobel the actor for one Our man was also very candid but his was um, less about life circumstances and more about life life-threatening near threatening life threatening near death experiences yep uh big fan of cars overall and he goes not the to- movie Nope, not the, the movie. The, the physicality, the, 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 the metal. Yeah, no, he goes into detail of, like, his first vehicle and so on, and that during one uh, drive, he ended up uh, in a severe crash, 
to the point that he hit a tree at remarkable height. I think he said like it was about 75 feet high. Mm -hmm. Uh, And after that sort of crash, uh, feeling like he's almost could like experience himself outside of his body. Yeah. Um, And he like feels out a real account for himself where he was able to sort of like measure certain things with his overall mind to be able to get to like the nearest overall house to overall um, thanks to the attention of someone who happened to just like yeah, get up in the middle of the night. It's 20 below and an off duty cop just happens to be nearby. Yeah. <laughs> Which very, very fortunate for this guy. And apparently after the incident, he still says that he could feel these out of body experiences. Just be like driving, driving and he'll have that experience. That seems like the worst time yeah. to put that to experience, I mean, I guess especially you could, with like, past effects. I guess you're watching yourself drive still. Be very disorienting though. I I can't imagine. Like there's only I can do the beep boop buttons with my fingers with third person driving. I don't know if I can do the beep boop movements of my arms while driving. That's fair. That's fair. I think it's really interesting how many of these cast members uh you end up finding out of like a very spiritual side. Yes. Um or a very artistic side or both. Yes. A lot of a lot of artists and a lot of spiritual people intermixed within the scope of the Twin Peaks crew, which feels appropriate. Absolutely. It really does. Um, Michael Horse, the actor for Deputy Tommy Hawk Hill, a.k.a. Hawk, mm-hmm. uh, he was talking about his love of art. He's a sculptor and a painter. Um, he kind of goes through a little bit with his career, his experiences as a Native American actor mm-hmm. uh, and advocate. And he brought up the situation where he was asked to play Tonto in a new version of the Lone Ranger. And he was about to say no, because like he doesn't think it's a very good role. It's kind of a stereotype. But yeah. then they're like, yeah, they'll give you $50,000 if you do for or do it. And he's like, all right, sign me up. Look, let's go. He said something very specific. What do you say? Hey, Kimasabi. <laughs> so referring to the character, right? Yep. I mean, he argues first, like, like, do you want to play Tonto? No, I'm an activist, just by mm-hmm. being very hardened onto the role. But overall, still, we all need um, means of income at the end of the day. Yeah. So he does end up accepting the work. But still, even with that and being part of the movies, he feels that uh, it, it's not as fulfilling to him. Right. He, he really does look for those scripts that he thinks speaks to him. It, it is just especially hard when there's not as many roles especially in American television for native American um, actors, you know, a lot of them are very stereotypical or very um, bit players. Um, You know, you have your, your, he mentions it a lot, but like you have your cases where someone's got to be a medicine man. It's just, it's it's like the same things over and over again. Um, Yeah. If I could just uh, shout something out, if anyone wants to know just like the history of like American or just more specifically Hollywood um, sort of accounts for like Indian culture, especially from the perspective of uh, other like Native Americans throughout, I recommend Real Injun, uh, R-E-E-L. I-N-J-U-N. It was released in about 2010. It's a very insightful documentary through and through with a fair amount of humor throughout Mm. uh, that takes on the overall accounts of (laughs) just, again, Hollywood incorporating these individuals and kind of how Hollywood butchers a lot of the overall culture behind it. Um, But yeah, uh, he's... But yes, inside of America, it seems that (laughs) it's not the... Best of times. There is uh, one thing he does actually shout out as well inside of the mm-hmm. interview itself, and that would be North of 60, which is a Canadian production in which actually takes on more reservation life um, mm-hmm. with Native Americans. Yeah, I, I haven't heard of the show before, but it does sound interesting. And mm-hmm. I feel like Hawk has developed his, his senses, at least in this documentary. As Michael someone Horse with, has. Yes, Hawk's the character. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Horse has established himself as someone that uh, has that sort of taste. He kind of looks at a lot of the scripts and kind of rolls his eyes. So mm-hmm. it sounds like he, he really thinks this show stands out. Um, yeah. He does also praise Twin Peaks in the sense that it was a good script. And um, he says that he was very proud of Hawk as a character. He says, he goes as far as to say that Hawk's one of the best characters ever written for television, which I think is interesting because I like Hawk. Uh, I never would have listed Hawk as that. Out of mm. all the characters in Twin Peaks, Hawk is not the first one I would go for. Mm-hmm. Um but I think it's cool that he feels that way. And then he, that he got to play a character that he feels that strongly about. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen very often. But yeah, he also says he has very little respect for the television business and industry. And he liked how Twin Peaks would scare people. Going back to what yeah. you said about David Lynch as a person, he kind of would push against the grain of some things. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming Michael Horst liked that aspect of Lynch's personality as well. No, I think that's pushing against the grain is probably something just generally important to get along with someone that is also involved with said grain. Mm-hmm. Professor, I feel like I'm about to fall into the grain of sleep. I am I am weak and I am tired <laughs> and I am weary. So you must carry my corpse to the end. 
Professor, can you do this? Um, sure, of course I can do that. Um, hello, this is the Twin Peaks Wonderful and Strange Podcast, where I am my own person to my own person. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. So, the biggest thing that I wanted to highlight, at the very least towards the end of our podcast, had to be just generally what fandom representation happens inside of the overall Twin Peaks special features, because they actually do highlight the fan festival, which had been going on for many years, over 25 years, uh, up to about 2019. But we get like this nice little scope into what a fan event of Twin Peaks has been. And as someone who's experienced conventions before, uh, it's something in very broader scopes that I've experienced. I've experienced things that focus on comic books. I find things that focus on Renaissance. I have found things that focus on anime. Uh, but something as specific as Twin Peaks, I can't help but be heavily curious on what that even looks like. Apparently, these events were overall focused on not only kind of a way to be a tourism spot, to in overall explore some history of the overall locations and just kind of enjoy some nice snippets with familiar people, because a lot of people who would come around here would be almost like in a yearly sense. They would come around. This would be an exciting event for everyone uh, to get to know each other and feel like they are overall connected in a way through Twin Peaks, which is absolutely exciting. Now, um, with these events, uh, I'm sure that you're curious, like, okay, there's the tourism part, right? Okay, uh, what, what other things you're curious on? Well, what if I told you that there were also um, the coordinators put on events Say, for example, uh, cherry tying with their tongues or throwing things such as little rocks, if you will, at bottles off in the distance, the Tibetan rock throw. <laughs> what sort of events would you like to see, Khalil, in something like a Twin Peaks inspired event? Oh, just blatant curiosity. Pin the pillow on the jock. Pin the pillow on the <laughs> It's a fun what? game where someone in the hotel is a killer. They just randomly pick someone, and their job is to see how many people they can suffocate in the hotel before they get caught. How does everything in my life turn into a mongus one way or another? <laughs> you just made an amogus. <laughs> I just made an amogus. <laughs> uh, what kind of event would I want? Um, I think you should take that very obscure re re deleted scene with Johnny Horn uh, shooting the, the clay pigeon kind of figures by the waterfall, okay. and we should get to shoot those. Okay, so something that's... I believe, that, I believe that's like a deleted scene if At I'm not the waterfall, mistaken. so it's like perilous. Like, if you fall, <laughs> you will die, and you're liable for so that. So you would go like... I'm also very life-threatening for some reason right now. <laughs> Apparently. So something that even is, like, hidden amongst the deleted scenes. Interesting. Yes. Interesting. Um, um, I also think we should have one where you reenact the uh, Sunny Jim and Pierre... Pure and sunny gym. This is not Twin Peaks. No, it's fine. You're going fine. outside Twin it's, Peaks. I think it's related enough. Get back in. So I think you have a moment where you just, you have two, you you, you put a balloon on top You're of your head. You're a madman. I put punch a balloon the on top microphone of your head, in defiance. And then someone else puts a balloon on top of their head and you scream. And then you die in I'm three gonna minutes. I'm going to scream. <laughs> those, are, those are some good ideas. <laughs> so... You, you, uh, After those particular events yeah. uh, and exploring more areas, you get pictures taken, which I thoroughly enjoyed the fact that around that time, there's just a bunch of people with a bunch of cameras and roll-up cameras and so on, where just one guy just stands at the very end and just, like, picks up each camera. Yeah. Snap. Snap. It's Snap. really interesting, like, it, the feeling of this, because we're we're watching this like 15 or so years after this would have been shot, right? Yeah. And this happened... 15 or so years after the show had finished. Yes. So rounding. we're in this very strange time period where when this festival was happening, the show had been off the air for a long time. Yes. But it was before the modern age of the internet. Like the internet yeah. existed, but this is before like there were Reddit and Facebook communities for Twin there Peaks There was still instant messaging though, in which that's how some yes. of these fans would end up saying but connected But it, it was not the modern internet that we know now. It's not. It felt very much uh, a nice, humble, sort of like close-knit group yeah. that was crafted from their overall fondness of Twin Peaks. And a lot of them were, yeah, probably people who either watched it in the 90s or were able to kind of inherit it from family at that time. Yes. And I feel like or people who just bring people in as guests or people who yeah. just like give these things away for gifts, like the tickets for these events. Yeah. So I think it was, I think it was really cool 
to kind of see that because I think that when the internet kind of came around differently, I think like, you know, Netflix came around and you had Twin Peaks on Netflix and you had The Return come out in 2017. I think a lot of new young people got into Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. This was a time before that boom. This was a time before the boom and I think that I love like these sort of like situations because if you say for example were to go off on towards your own, dependent on like your involvement initially, there's a lot to get lost on from the different mm -hmm. sites and places we've mentioned beforehand. Uh, not to mention, very expensive. Uh, yeah. Like say for example, not the physical location internally of the Great Northern Hotel, but externally uh, if you go into the overall lodge that is present there, uh, that's 400 bucks a the night. One, the one right by the waterfall? Right by the waterfall. Famous waterfall. 400 bucks a night. 400 bucks a night. Delicious. So... <laughs> I know that I would end up probably losing a bunch of money in the first place. So having a package deal at the very yeah. least to know what you're going in for is something very like comforting. Not to mention, there's also just fun and interesting events. So I mentioned anime before and I mentioned mm -hmm. comic books. There's cosplay that goes on for that. There's a costume content yeah. uh, that's also involved. I thought it was very funny. Some of the things that the camera people and editing decided to like leave in. Yeah. So like with the costuming, there was literally like there was there was some people like low key like knocking their competitors like insulting them in the interview process. Yeah. Or I thought everyone did a great job except, except for that Maddie girl. Yeah, it's just saying, so no, no, no. clear. It wasn't like a great job. It's like people actually tried except oh, for that Maddie girl. You're right. Which, which uh, she actually went through uh, and she's also has additional makeup such as blood across yeah. the eyes and so on, which just seems like it gets in the way. Uh, she said that she re uh, watched through the experiences of what was going on, um, like for her character to. Just like, yeah. go back into that sort of situation, and then there's also uh, a point where she wins the trivia contest against like people who are veterans and have been there uh, pre-internet time as well. So like I don't know if like this person who believes that this person's not trying hard enough, who has actively won the competition. I think it's funny. <laughs> they're, like, they're a hater at that point. They are um, a hater at that but, point. But like there's other moments too. Like there's um. There's this one where the camera's just weirdly on someone as their like shoulder strap falls down on their outfit and yeah, puts awkward. it back up and it's like, why are you, why, hey, why is That's the camera creepy. on that? And then why did you leave it in? <laughs> it seems like, I think that they were going through like this, this something that just exists inside the space and like yeah. people are here, like actual people, but at the same time, it's creepy. And there was, um, there was a part where they were going through someone like quoting like lines. I think it was a lot of the fish in the percolator lines it has like two or three people quoting a line verbatim. And then it cuts to this poor guy who is like admitting he's not very good at remembering lines. They left that in too. So it's like, everyone's like quoting lines. It's like, I'm not really that good at remembering lines. Again, and then it just moves on. It's I, like, I oh. think it's showing the range of interest to try to welcome people in, but it backfires because yeah. Yeah. It's bad. It, yeah. it was bad with trying to compel. There, with there's some moments that feel a little mean spirited. Um, yes. you know, that's all I'm saying. But still, I, I think that for the majority of it, it seems to still be well spirited though. Yeah. I, I think that it's nice to see people like dancing around as party time, Leo Johnson. Yes. Uh, or going into specific moments inside of like, uh, episodes where someone dresses up with Andy with tape on his head. I think it's, it's also interesting too that twin peaks as a fan community, has to have a sort of dark sense of humor at a certain point. Yeah. Because you have people wearing party time Leo Johnson swinging soap, like, around. And just like, hey, I'm party time Leo Johnson. I'm reenacting domestic abuse. Yep. And then you have also at the same time people dressed up as Laura Palmer in the plastic. And it's just like... It's, and it's, that's a popular one. So that's, that's a popular it's one. It's more than just and, this and, year. And Maddie, the murder victim. It's like wild. And, 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 and you know, I think it's one of those things that it's not going to be for everyone. But it's not going to be for everyone, but it certainly would have been for me if I knew about Twin Peaks yeah, before. Yeah, it's, 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 there's so many really serious, dark, important themes, you know, in Twin Peaks that you and I talk about. And we're always, you know, at least I know I'm speaking for myself. I'm always nervous. Like, you know, because we're uploading this to the internet. I'm like, oh God, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I do the wrong thing? But then I also got to remember like Twin Peaks fan communities, it's it's complicated. Like for mm -hmm. all these dark, serious things that deserve, you know, serious conversation. One of the most popular costumes to dress as is this high school prom queen murdered. Like it's just a very Not strange- just for these events, but also again, for parties. There's that, there's that actual, was it, was it Funko Pop or some other brand? They had the little figure- and one of, the, one of the figures they sold was Laura Palmer in the it's plastic wrap. Laura Palmer in plastic, another one that I saw that I actually kind of want, yeah. uh, is Leland Palmer with white hair. Yes, and the, and the Funko. Yeah, that was a and Funko. I, and he, Bob is also a Funko. Yeah. Like what a, what, what, so I actually found out about that because someone who also was a huge uh, fan yeah. uh, of it, um, 
Uh, future Bill, Future Bill, if you happen to be listening, hey, how's it going? Uh, he was proudly presenting something such as a Bob Funko Pop, as well as naming a cat Bob, if you will. It, it's it's such a it's such a fascinating sort of like dive that I can go into mm-hmm. onto the fan community that I just adore from what I've seen so far, and I look forward to whatever amount I can dig into deeper after we eventually get through the return, and then there's nothing left to be spoiled for me. But yes, yeah, <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. Getting there. Um. Next time, we're talking about the Lost Highway. Hey, the uh, the David Lynch film uh, from the very it's a very mid nineties film. Yay! Uh, it's got some industrial elements that I'm excited to get your thoughts on. Ooh. You're going to be cultured by some music. I enjoy culture. All those times where I tried to show you Nine Inch Nails and you said no, they're going to become relevant. Yes. I, if they're inside of a film, they'll only be as relevant as the soundtrack. hey Hey, I got the soundtrack on CD, and you're welcome to borrow, because okay. it's a banger. No, I I, I have no uh, discounts against any sort of, like, other bands, if you will. Yeah. Uh, I'm in, I enjoy whenever people can help me fall into them. It's just I never re- usually seek out yeah. them personally. I am, I am really curious how I end up feeling. I'm also curious what you think, but I'm really curious for myself, admittedly, because Lost Highway is one that I remember really liking when I first got into David Lynch's work to the extent that I liked it more than some of his more popular films. Like I just really resonated with, with Lost Highway and it worked for me, but kind of on, 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 Further thinking about it and kind of talking with other friends, it, it feels to have more of a middling place for a lot of people and a lot of friends that I know who like Lynch. So I'm really curious how this will stack up and hold up. Okay. Because if I go off of what I remember, this would be up there, you know, I'd like this more than um, Wild at Heart or Elephant Man or Dune from what I remember of it. But mm. will it hold up to that that uh, that prestige? I don't know. Time and for you, it's got to pass that test of is it new enough? Is it different enough? Is it trying different things in a way that is interesting to you? Most or is it going to be Lynch retreading ground? Most importantly, I would say, is it fun enough? Is it something in which I can engage in? It doesn't even have to be like happy as an emotion, but is it something that I can very much gel with what's going on with it? And also, this is the first time we're moving post Twin Peaks, isn't it? Other than some short films. This is our first feature film that is after Fire Walk With Me. Mm. So that'll be curious to see if it carries that weight that Fire Walk With Me had, and if so, in what ways. Absolutely. But first... First. I have a wonderful and strange question of the week for you. Please. It's a pretty straightforward one. Yes. It's kind of a, a Mark Frost straight shooter kind of question. You mm. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Which documentary featurette was your favorite from the ZDA collection? So it's not, how do I feel about David Lynch? After? No, no, no. I'm, <laughs> after- not, I'm not asking that this time. No, I can't promise it won't come up with Lost Highway. What's my favorite feature uh, so far? From feature, the- like, yeah, like the things in the menu, which is your favorite one? Gotcha. You, so you had from to say which everything, one. not just like the documentary. From the documentaries. From the documentaries, very yes. well. Yes. Um, clearly it was the reflections. You would say that to spite me, but that's not your favorite. <laughs> Why do you tell me what I can or can't Because you made like? it pretty clear you didn't think it was a full success. <laughs> you were wording it that way. I'm complicated. Anyway, no, I think the postcards. Okay. Absolutely the postcards that's because that's something I don't get to see as often whenever it comes to these special features, which is fine because usually with these special features, you're focusing on the material people have about. But I think that with just the size of the overall cast and crew and getting a chance to kind of like dig deeper mm-hmm. into their brains... I like that. I like to see what these people are like outside of these ends because I like to see the fuller person, Mm -hmm. Uh, not only for just my own sort of like blatant curiosity, not only for my own means of association, just so I do not call someone Benjamin Horn for the rest of my life, (laughs) Um, but also because you can come out with little glass, like little spy glasses into people's overall interesting perspectives and ways that... Mm -hmm otherwise would be improbable. Uh, and I find especially those who maybe be able to afford larger trips off into the distances that I can already associate with with things such as this media. It's almost as if it's almost like a vicarious experience at mm-hmm. times, um, being able to associate these people inside my head enough that they are not strangers, but also dive into their stories. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. Professor, I'm very sleepy. Could you, as we close out this episode, could you please tell me a bedtime story? Once upon a time, in a peak 
or two, far, far away, there was a Bob. <laughs>